From with your mind, no one else can find a liar that you inspire. From another place, not from outer space. From some place, even higher. From the stars.
everyone! How you doing? <clears throat> Welcome to another VHS Vault stream! How's it going? Let's see, um... Meru-sama, thanks for 32 months, says, 32 months, yay, just four more until our next sub bunny. Exciting. Um, and was there anything else? I think that was it. Cool. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Your mother worked at AOL during the Y2K craze, the stories she can tell. Uh, I bet. Anadon Earhart, thanks for 24 months, um, says sub bunnies. If you want, if people can have sub bunnies if they want instead of sub babies. <laughs> Happy second anniversary, by the way. All right, let's just get into it. <laughs> let's learn how to survive Y2K with Leonard Nimoy. For those who don't know, I, I assume most of my audience does. I don't know how much of my audience is younger than me. Um, Y2K was... <sighs> Old computers had a thing where when they were designed, or rather when the software was designed... How do I put this? The date formatting was such that it didn't work past the year 2000. It didn't work past 99 because the entire date set, from what I understand, was based upon, you know, it being still the 20th century and they didn't really future-proof it in a lot of systems and it would have fucked a lot of stuff up. Um, a lot of people panicked about this. It became a hysteria, basically. Um, yeah, dates were two digits, not four. Thank you. So it would be like 99 and then it would switch to 00, zero and the computer would think it was the year 1900 whatever and it would fuck up some stuff anyway um people panicked and there was kind of a hysteria about it but to be clear software people did have to spend a lot of time very very hard working on updating systems to make sure it didn't cause problems and it, it went smoothly so things were fine um thanks to the work of a lot of people updating many systems uh but anyway Regardless, there was this kind of hysteria about it, and that's why you get tapes like this, where Lenny, Leonard Nimoy, Spock, is going to explain why what we should do to prepare. This is good information. Gregory Term says this is the gayest shirt I've ever seen. Nice. It, oh, it is. <laughs> Thank you. We must learn to think in other categories. Quote. Our island in space. Our home. Our civilization. Our human innovations. How could the omission of two simple digits affect the destiny of all humankind? Why <laughs> 2 k what does it mean? How will it affect you, your family, your community, your nation, our world? Y2K, how can we prepare individually? How can we work together as global neighbors to make the best of whatever may occur before and after January 1st of the year 2000? So was Nimoy like into this stuff or did they just cut him a big enough check? Like were the 90s scant for this man like why is he slumming it in this weird tape y2k from its historical roots to its possible effects on the future of civilization <laughs> he's re he's definitely reading off cue cards so he didn't even bother to like memorize a script for this you can see he's reading off <laughs> I think literal cards because it doesn't look like it's a teleprompter because he's not looking directly into the camera like you normally would with a teleprompter. <laughs> um, Chromatic Cuttlefish says, Someone once noted that about 50% of all the Y2K remediation was unnecessary, the trouble being it was impossible to tell which 50% in advance. <laughs> then I would say it was all necessary. Effects that are so complex that perhaps only chaos theory could calculate the multiple ramifications of what may occur. 
I'm Leonard Nimoy, your guide, as we explore all aspects of the Y2K phenomenon, including how we, humankind, can utilize Y2K as an opportunity to look at ourselves, to analyze where we've been, and to adjust our sights for the future. Oh, there's gonna be so much padding in this tape. <laughs> They had an idea for this tape, and they want to put Y2K on the cover to get the rubes to buy it, you know? <laughs> but now we got to fill out an hour tape, so it seems worthwhile, you know? I assume that the actual advice is probably just going to be general, like, preparedness advice, right? Which is probably fine advice, like, hey, have you know, uh, emergency food and water and stuff. Like, that's that's fine advice in general. I don't know if it's specific to Y2K, though. Seculoid, thanks for raiding. Welcome, raiders. There's a link to Seculoid. Go check them out. Reloaded after nothing happens on Y2K. Well, my work is done here. What do you mean your work is done? You didn't do anything. <laughs> didn't die. Didn't die. <laughs> Beautiful. It's important to understand just how scared and distrustful people older than millennials were, are of computers. This just fed into that technophobia as well as growing anxiety over a world they understood less and less as time goes on. Yeah. I used to write programs back in the 60s and 70s and was so proud of the fact that I was able to squeeze a few elements of space by not having to put 19 before the year. It never entered our minds that those programs would have lasted more than a few years, Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan. There is an ancient myth of what may have been the most highly advanced civilization ever to dwell on the planet Earth. Oh God, Atlantis? Legend has it that this civilization was perhaps more technologically advanced. I didn't have Atlantis on my Y2K preparedness video bingo card. <laughs> ...than our human civilization is today, on the brink of the third millennium AD. But the legend also ends, suddenly, with the revelation that this entire ancient civilization vanished, that their great island sank into the sea because their technological innovations were too far ahead of their human judgments, human foresight, and simple human frailties. This legendary civilization was, of course, Atlantis. <laughs> Yet the problem for us in the letter it was a it's a I know we didn't write the script. <laughs> Your nineteen the metaphor ninety nine is that we are no longer musing on what may or may not have happened a long, long time ago. Rather, we Atlantis sank because they had Y2K first. Yeah, in BC. That's how it works. We're facing very real global issues related to power supply, satellite communications, water, Thanks, healthcare, transportation, distribution of food, and other items vital to everyday human survival. These global issues are the direct result of an equally real human oversight many people now refer to as Negative Y2K, yeah. As the Y2K, or year 2000 problem, which derives from the fact that billions of lines of computer code and embedded microchips that now run the very technologies we all depend upon. The eerie digital beeping in the background isn't annoying at all. Good editing choice. Karanic Cuttlefish says, also for all you youngins out there, the equi uh, Unix eco- Oh God, Epoch Epocalypse is coming at 3.14.07 UTC on 19th January, 2038. Something to look forward to. I don't, I assume that's something similar. Wasn't thinking about how to program it for the future. May fail in that briefest moment between December 31st, 1999 and January 1st, 
2000. And so, we recall the fate of Atlantis. The primary question for our civilization as we approach the year 2000 is this. Have we allowed our own highly advanced technological innovations to far outpace our human abilities to control those innovations? And most importantly, to foresee their ultimate consequences? In order to find an answer to this fundamental question, and in order to prepare... I've seen this. This is just Frankenstein again. ...prepare ourselves and our communities for whatever... What if technology but too much? Leonard Nimoy wrote Black Mirror. Y2K may bring... We need to understand the history and ramifications of Y2K from its very beginning decades ago to these remaining... Do you think that, like, there were <laughs> the, the, the sort of doomsayers of technology back in the day? Do you think they were like, Grog, Grog make fire. Fire seem good now and keep warm, but soon fire burn whole world to ground. Grog not meant to metal with hot fire. I don't know how, I don't know how, I, I mean, you get the, you get the bit. <laughs> Days of the 20th century as we confer with a cross-section of the men and women on the front lines of the Y2K <sighs> campaign. We begin by returning to the startlingly simple roots of Y2K. When I get out here in these speeches and hearings and uh, other presentations, the first thing that comes up is that people say, is, say, how do we get into this mess? The story of Y2K really begins several decades ago, back in the 50s, with a very enterprising woman by the name of Grace Murray Hopper. Her nickname was Amazing Grace because of all the outstanding accomplishments. Whoa, left flank vets, thanks for raiding. That's a huge raid. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah. I'm a trans leftist variety streamer. I cover all sorts of stuff. Today we're doing something fun. We're looking at old VHS tapes. This is something I like to do for kind of you know, blowing off steam days when we're not talking about conspiracy theorists or politics or anything like that. Um, everyone go check out Left Flank Vets. Really awesome channel. Um, please, uh, in the in the chat, there's a link. Whoop. Um, so hello, everyone. If you like what you see, give me a follow. <laughs> um, just Belmont, thanks for 17 months. In her life. Oh, right now we're watching uh, Preparing for Y2K with Leonard Nimoy. So Spock is helping us figure out what's going to happen when all our, I don't know, cool IMAX, the colorful ones, when those uh, break. No, that was early 2000s. They were in Zoolander. <sighs> Mike Max with 50 Bits says, So you're telling me all this hysteria could have been prevented if they just added 19 to the year, but they didn't because they thought it was easier to use the last two digits. Correct. One of her accomplishments was the invention of the compiler for computer programs, which translates regular written language into the ones and zeros of binary code. It was the idea that said the switch in a transistor is either on or off. And therefore, you can write code that can be read mechanically by a series of transistors strung together that show that they are either on or off. And that was the beginning of what we now call digital code. Maybe even more important. It's interesting hearing someone in the 90s try and explain binary to people. I don't know. Grace Hopper was centrally involved in the creation of COBOL. Now these days, middle schoolers are making like crazy Minecraft, like <laughs> redstone computers and stuff with manual like switches. COBOL. Computer business oriented language became all pervasive throughout the computer systems of America and eventually the world. The technology itself is very prevalent in our advanced society, and the failure points um, potentially span from a very simple industrial process to a very complex uh, financial transaction. That we don't really understand the incredible impact of that little notion that a switch can be either on or off. That a punch in an IBM card can either be in or out. In the primitive days of computers, mainframes relied on the use of Hollerith cards, which were cardboard cards with holes punched in them, to create computer programs. They operated. 
I am so thankful for the insane humans who developed and used these systems, because I wouldn't have the patience for it. I wouldn't, I, I, I use a computer every day for work, this is what I do, you know? But if it wasn't built for stupid people like me, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> these people sitting there for hours programming by poking holes in cards, it's psychotic. It's honestly insane. I'm, I'm so happy for them, but they must have been goddamn nuts. <laughs> Computers sort of like the way an old piano scroll would create music on a player piano. I'd been a university president for 18 years, and I remembered guy. right away that we had these huge mainframe computers. That Can you imagine if you had, like, and I'm sure this happened all the time, you have some kind of program you're doing, and you're doing the thing, and you have almost the whole card done, and then you realize, oh, fuck, halfway through this, I did something wrong, and I gotta restart. Can you put the things back in? Probably not. I don't know. <laughs> just seems like a pain in the ass. Took up room after room after room. The kind of computer power you can now get on a laptop used to require a system that was so large it literally had to be housed in its own building. That's funny too, because this was like the 90s and now, you know, this phone in my hand is more powerful than probably 10 90s lab cop laptops combined, probably more. I don't know computers, like I said, so I might be underestimated. <laughs> So, as more and more COBOL programs totaling in the millions and eventually billions were written on Hollerith cards, the sheer expense of computing began to really add up. And so in the 60s, some bright programmers said, wait a minute, why are we punching in 1967? Why don't we just put 67, save the 19? That's when major businesses and government institutions began finding ways to cut corners. One of the most fateful cost-cutting measures was to deliberately leave out the first two digits of the year date. So in the year 2000, and they knew this at the time, you would have 00, zero pop up, not 2000. So the computer thinks it could be 1900, 000, and that's the problem. So yeah, we may have saved a lot of money by eliminating those two digits, but here we are, 40 years How later. How much money could that and have the possibly cost of saved? Problems because of this omission, is in the trillions of dollars. Companies aren't spending 100 million dollars or more, or and the uh, companies totally spending billions of dollars as a public relations device. They are doing it because they have a real problem to fix and a real challenge to face. That flaw that got put into the system in terms of two digits for a date instead of four has become, over the last 25 years, absolutely pervasive. We're not going to be able to predict with any certainty where the breakdowns may or may not occur. Uh, will it be a nuclear power plant? Will it be the uh, airplanes in the sky? Will it be the food supply chains, transportation? There are so many possibilities. Eight hospital system has probably 45,000 pieces of medical devices of which probably 25% of those are going to need to be tested. The generation and distribution of electricity. Why does an MRI need to know what year it is? Today is, is really... Like what, what equipment needs to know what year it is in a hospital? Is it just to interface with some other system? How complicated were, could the computer systems have been in the 90s in a hospital? Like what I don't... I guess I don't understand. Be done. I believe them, obviously. I absolutely believe them, I just don't. With com oh, billing reasons. Fuck. <laughs> the National Federation- Oh no, we not, might not be able to charge people exorbitant amounts of money for healthcare. The horror. ...of independent business <laughs> estimates that approximately 82% of all U.S. small businesses might have a problem and only 50% had taken any kind of action by the middle of 1998. And the flaw is everywhere. Yes, it's in computer programs, software programs. It's also embedded into those microcomputers that we call chips. The embedded chip devices work anywhere or go anywhere from a um, dialysis machine, an anesthesia machine, a CT scanner, IV pumps, all different kinds of equipment that nurses use on the floor, um, lab equipment. Overthought says, so you're telling me we were one com computer bug away from free healthcare? <laughs> no, but it's nice to think, isn't it? Equipment, lab devices, um, x-ray, pharmacy, it, it affects every department within a hospital. 
if you look at a, a production line now in automotive, uh, there is a tremendous amount of automation. You, in most cases, find that there's a, a, a software program running in there that has dates in it. And the estimates we get on our committee are that between two and possibly five percent of those chips will fail. And you don't know which two to five percent they are, and you don't know where they are. The early warnings about Y2K, however, were either ignored or deliberately rebuffed. I think 90s Nimoy is underrated. He was in an episode um, of the 90s Outer Limits. He was a lawyer in iRobot, was the name of the episode. It's pretty good. Primarily for... Hbeard says, in the UK, are computer chips called computer fries? For economic reasons, <sighs> but also due to bureaucracies typical of large corporations and government agencies. If people don't... Spoiler alert, nothing crashed and burned. Well, don't spoil it. I wanted to see if civilization survived. I was hoping it didn't. <laughs> no, and corporations had to approach this issue because we're looking at their whole enterprise. We're not just looking at a section. We're looking at all the code that's ever been written. We're looking at anything that's connected with the code. We're looking at outside vendors. We're looking at internal and external interfaces. This is not a technological problem. It sounds like it. It's a management problem. It is estimated that over $600 billion is being spent worldwide to address the Y2K problem. The simple dilemma is that there are so many lines of code and microchips that need to be reviewed that there are just not enough computer professionals and not enough days left before January 1st, 2000 to look into every area that must be addressed. I wonder if Y2K was a thing in Fallout? I mean, in Fallout, they're still using, like, tubes and stuff. They're not even using microprocessors. That's, like, a big part of Fallout is they didn't develop the microprocessor, but they got really advanced in, like, energy, radiation, and stuff like that. And, like, sci-fi, clunky 50s robots. Huge management challenge to uh, make the changes in all of the lines of code and all of the machinery and all of the embedded chips that are affected with this problem. The report card was established to get people's attention and it has cabinet members talk about it agency heads talk about it that's what we want but basically what we rate on that report card is the degree of progress that has occurred between the last quarterly report and the present and you have five or six D's and five or six F's it's weird that one year this was the EPA line one year the EPA got a B then they got an F, then a B and a B plus. What was happening on the F day? <laughs> like, what happened? You know, you have a problem there. And I must Did all their software revert? Say it did get a little Oh, the Department of Transportation sucks. The Department of Justice. Oof. And among the cabinet. In some cabinet meetings, they've said, hey, what did you get from him? You know, so, but it, it puts it down where the public can understand it and not have a bunch of statistics that nobody can understand. You've got the software problem that people can quickly understand. You've got the embedded chip problem that they probably haven't thought about. And then you have the connections problem that can ultimately kill you. Computers talk to one another information is transferred from one system to another and if that information is not transferred because the computer in question doesn't understand the change. Can I just say that filling the back of the frame with a zoomed in version of the guy in the foreground is a bad choice for an interview. <laughs> Don't do that. If you're interviewing someone for any purpose, this is horrifying. Don't do this. <laughs> change of date. Like, why? If the data that is transferred is affected by a date and causes a, a loss of, of uh, integrity of that data, then what has happened is that other computers are affected by that. It can be passed on and on and on. In other words, the FAA, a year ago, had a problem with the radar system. They took it into the laboratory, thought they'd fixed it, just looks great, worked great. They got it into a tower, and when you suddenly have thousands of interactions from airplanes and everything else, people problems, you name it, and it didn't work. So they had to work on it in the live operational context. That type of interconnection is really the, the basis of the problem of Y2K. 
There were indeed early efforts. Why didn't they just use a VPN? YouTube didn't exist yet, so there weren't obnoxious YouTubers giving them ads every other video for scam VPNs. So they just didn't know about it. Decades ago to warn major public corporations. Luckily, they were able to get Raid Shadow Legends in time, so. ...and government organizations about the Y2K problem. Despite the fact that there have been a whole lot of so-called Y2K experts popping up in recent years, the fact is that as early as 1960, there were already a number of computer and government professionals trying to warn us about the long-term implications of dropping the first two digits of the year date code. My fear is that they've waited too long and they need to get busy and, and get started. If they wait much longer, truly, there won't be time for them to upgrade their systems, test their systems, and put them back into production. In 1967, the U.S. National Bureau of Standards was given the responsibility to resolve the controversy and went about doing that by surveying federal agents. Can I just point out we're 15 minutes into this video and we've been given zero information on how to survive Y2K. Well, the problem with that scenario was that the Department of Defense was by far the largest user of computers in the world. And it had more important things to worry about at the time, like the Vietnam War. Uh, it's a natural process, you know, to not want to have to face a, a painful situation or a difficult situation. But uh, my advice to uh, the American public is get over it. So the Department of Defense basically told the National Bureau of Standards that there was no way they were going to convert the four digits for the year date code. Now a very able woman in the Department of Transportation even earlier suggested they do something in 1987 and she was laughed at. The old boy network, you know, what do you know, etc. She was right and if they'd listened to her we wouldn't be in the bad shape in the federal government that we are right now. In the but then they would have had to listen to a woman, so. The last several years, more and more professionals working in the field of computer science have written papers, books, or have spoken publicly about what may occur at the end of the millennium as a result of Y2K. So we have to do something very, very dramatic. This should be the number one priority of every CEO in the country. We can't, uh, we can't do this without a much higher level of awareness to get everybody involved. One of the major problems everywhere is getting people to understand that Y2K is everybody's problem right now. The debate has been all or nothing. Either the system is going to stop totally or then people say, well, then there's no problem. And the problem, uh, I think the system will not stop, but that doesn't mean we don't have major problems. Here's for us has fun fact, the inventor of the ARM chips that make smartphones possible is a trans woman. Oh, that's cool. It is our primary goal in this program to help families and communities across the world to prepare and to work together regardless of what may or may not occur as a result of Y2K. There still exists, even in 1999, a general state of either denial, complacency, or even apathy about both the reality and the potential effects of Y2K. And unless we appreciate what may occur, we may not be ready, either individually or as a civilization. In dead of winter, at the stroke of midnight, January 1st, 2000, yes. elevators may stop. Heat may vanish. Yes. Credit cards and ATMs may cease to function. Yes. Airplanes and trains may come to a halt. Yes. I think the airplane will probably speed up before it halts, but yes. Anadon Earhart says, who was the target audience? It might have been Musk-type executive. Telephones and televisions may not utter a sound. Water delivery systems may not deliver water for cooking, drinking, or bathing. Street lights, stop lights, lights in buildings everywhere may flicker out. Hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, may be unable to provide proper medical care. 
banks, and stock markets around the world may suffer some form of meltdown. And nuclear power plants may cease to I'm generate horrified. The electricity you win, Leonard Nimoy. For all aspects of our daily lives. What is going to happen is a combination of events, hundreds of thousands of events, literally across the globe. What is this effect? affect? Stop it! <laughs> Stop! Other systems. One of the key aspects of chaos theory is the idea of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, which basically means that one small thing happening over here can eventually cause really big things to happen on the other side of the world you will start to see systems coming down. That you have a potential for power outages, water outages. Gregory Terms says, this is so odd. Why, why is it so fear-mongery? Well, I don't know. I'm wondering if at the end they're gonna try and sell you more stuff. Like, call this number and buy our survival kit or something. I don't know. My main worry is the energy grid. And if we can't get power, we can't get water. Water will be available in most municipalities, but I am convinced there are some where the water system will break down. It'll be more like a cancer where one little problem kind of leads to another problem, is connected to another problem. I think we should all prepare ourselves for a ground war on the year 2000 issue when it comes to insurance coverage. I expect we will have brownouts and regional blackouts. Communities will have disruptions, and maybe this other community will have a different disruption than this one. So it's something that is totally unpredictable. And it will just kind of spread. And, and I spoke with a lady at the IRS here a few months ago, and she had 3,000 people working on the, on the year 2000 conversion, still can't get it completed by the year 2000. I think there are individual banks that will probably go bankrupt. There are individual credit unions that will disappear over this issue. We get people who email us and say, I'm a Y2K fixer at a major bank. And every time we try it, it crashes. There are medical machines that will fail in ICU units. What we're finding are computer programs that don't work. The hospital's revenue stream may stop, just dead stop. Some people- Oh no! <laughs> Why is that his first concern? No. The revenue stream of the hospital helping people? <laughs> Jesus Christ, America. Nemesaur Colbaugh, thanks for gifting 10 tier one subs to the community. People will die. Not doing anything about the Y2K problem could lead to failure of up to 330,000 small businesses. You know, things just kind of topple over one after the other. We're oh, uh, and we're on a hype train, 88% to level three. Talking about a loss of a way of life, you know, our dependence on this uh, uninterrupted life in which the uh, energy grid supplies a lot of our needs on a daily basis. You're going to see um, some real dislocation, panic, fear. And the problem globally is worse than it is here. Look to the countries who are emerging countries to have the worst problems. There are some developing countries in the world I think that you will not be able to make phone calls from. So oh no, I won't be able to use a phone booth. When will I make my calls? Somewhere airlines uh, will be advised not to fly. It's just gonna... Uh, Y2K could have saved us from 9-11. I'm just saying. Explode. The biggest problem is energy and defense. The fact is that only 24 countries are addressing the year 2000 problem. Those governments have decided either that the problem doesn't apply to them or that they'll just wait and see what doesn't work and then fix it afterwards. You know, my system is down. It's flat off the air. It just won't even boot up. It's not running. And Y2K itself, that is the changeover from December 31st, 1999 to January 1st, 2000, is not the only date in 1999 or 2000 that presents possible problems. Ah, he was off by one year. One of those is what's called the problem of the nines, or September 9, 1999. Getting closer. The 9999, the, that terrible day that uh, a lot of computers have actually been told to turn off. Everyone who has a fiscal year 
uh, that begins before the end of 1999 will, whether it's April 1, July 1, or in the case of the federal government, October 1, will have a fiscal year 2000 uh, challenge to deal with their financial systems, which will at that point be in the fiscal year 2000. Then we may see computers shutting down in April and May when a great many states start their fiscal year. When those computers start trying to think, so to speak, in terms of the year 2000, they may shut down. You also have July the 1st, which is going to be a big banking day. Um, expect the federal government to come in right in the middle of the summer and start working some banks that are not compliant. That's going to be possibly the first indicator for a lot of people. During the last few months of 1998, word about Y2K began to gradually enter the public consciousness. And now, in 1999, the seriousness of what may occur has spread around the world. And we found, as people come along and say, oh, we're on great shape, we're on a great track, we're in great shape, we have everything under control. Stone Corbell, thanks for gifting a sub, getting us over level three of the hype train. Look how much compliance we've got, and then the test comes back. Uh, no, you're not. And when we think there's some hokey pokey going on, as it did in defense a year ago, where they wiped off for the next term a uh, couple of hundred critical mission systems, and we looked at that, we said, gee, are they working that fast suddenly to clean up that mess? And no, they weren't. They just wanted to look good, so they knocked a few off. They redefined them. They said they aren't critical mission, wham, so their total went down, and which angered me in the sense of them trying to pull that stunt. Despite all the computer systems that need to be reviewed and possibly fixed, and despite all the possible consequences of Y2K that have been outlined thus far, there is indeed ample room not only for hope, but even optimism in some areas. A number of vital government organizations, such as the Social Security Administration, have been working on Y2K since 1994 and will be ready for the year 2000. Major banks, such as Chase Manhattan, have been addressing Y2K since the early 90s and have diligently prepared for the year 2000 turnover. Even in the world of personal computers, Macintosh systems have been Y2K compliant since the mid-1980s. And President Clinton has appointed a special Y2K czar to oversee a nationwide campaign to address, review, and resolve every aspect of Y2K as it affects America and the world. The first thing uh, we have to do is have the public feel comfortable that they know what's going on. They know what's being fixed, they know what still remains to be done, they know where the risks are. Uh, the second thing they need to know is that we're managing against the problem, not just the federal government, uh, but the major uh, companies in critical sectors in the economy. In other words, even though our society has been slow to realize the full implications of Y2K, human ingenuity is now at work on both large and small scales. The FAA has been uh, having meetings and schedules that are being set and every equipment, uh, piece of equipment has been identified that will need Mr. software Whiskers, modifications. We also have backup systems for backup four. systems, that's the way we always do business and I'm sure that the uh, priorities of keeping flights going is going to be number one Tell for us the how economy. to survive, Leonard Nimoy. Me And uh, number two for the safety of everyone. The problem has been um, worked on now for two or three years um, at a steady pace and we're making Imagine good progress and I think in we the found nine, the main... Nine, 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 nine. Well, we'll all be dead, so it's their problem if people even exist then. Your bugs, there certainly will be a lot of little things go wrong, but as a whole, I think it'll just be more of a nuisance. At the very I would imagine by the year 9999, we wouldn't even be on the same calendar. Why would we be? Of the 150 if mission critical survived. systems in our agency, last year in, in September, uh, we completed uh, all uh, repair of all systems except for one, which should be uh, repaired shortly. Secondly, uh, we've tested all but uh, about uh, eight or nine systems. So we're, we're very confident that we're going to meet uh, uh, the dates set by uh, the government for all of our mission critical systems. 
At this point, uh, we have no indication. MN Broodwitch, thanks for 26 months, says let's go 54% to level 4 with a minute left on the hype. If there's any reason for people to assume that there are going to be any major failings in uh, power or telecommunication or financial systems, and in fact, quite the contrary, the major companies in those industries are making very strong and good progress. And that's what I believe too. I think people will pull together into this year 2000 version and, and we'll, we'll pull together as one unit and get this done. I don't see that there'll be a catastrophic uh, uh, failure where seconds. there's uh, riots and you know people running around shooting each other and things like that. The people that are going to get a gun and a year's supply of food and run to the mountains will find a lot of other people with guns in the mountains in a bad mood. <laughs> I love that. All the doomsday prepper stuff, like I like preparing for emergencies is great. But I'm talking about like the crazy people who think they're gonna like get a gun and like be on their own and not like ever <laughs> interact with other people. Like you know the kind of person I'm talking about. Not someone who's a prepper for safety or like for a hobby, but someone who's a prepper because they want to shoot people. <laughs> I think those kind of people need to hear that more often. That's not how this works. We're a, we're a social species. We work together in communities and farm and all that fun stuff. So if the end of society happens and we no longer have technology to rely upon, you're probably gonna have to hang around and farm or something. The gun, like, I don't know. You can have your gun, but like, don't be weird about it. Just don't be weird. So it's best to stay in your community. This is a community problem. We handle it at the community level. Uh, if the immediate response is to buy machine guns and camouflage and uh, lock ourselves off from our neighbors, well then what's happening is what's in the human heart is boiling to the surface. Uh, that's why Christians have got to challenge, challenge that. Oh God, what? Whole mentality. Oh no, is this, is, this, is this a religious tape? Is this a secret religious tape? With a non-selfish, serving kind of mentality that makes a difference in the lives of their neighbors. It starts with you. And I think if everybody does their job, and puts a lot of thought in it and, and does the right thing and just simply prepare, then I think you'll, you'll make it just fine. One of the things that the Y2K event is likely to... Uh... This is just a beautiful image. I think this is one of the most beautiful images that were ever eternally etched onto magnetic tape. Look at that, gorgeous. <laughs> you might not like it, but this is the ideal specimen of masculinity, okay? This guy is the alpha male. His name is Chad Chatterson. Chad Thundercock, okay? This guy's awesome. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to initiate is a rediscovery of community. <laughs> Most people today have lost touch with community. We live lives that are very insulated from one another. This is not the end of the world. This is a problem. Things are gonna be broken. The electricity may be broken. We will have to be patient while it's being fixed. That's all. And you know what? While it's being fixed, we might actually enjoy some family time. <laughs> it's a three Chad moon. It may be also that uh, we come to realize that technology doesn't supply all the answers that we hoped it had. Uh, one of the ways that we're gonna be testing ourselves, of course, is to have a more concerned relationship with our fellow man. I think that really goes without saying. I think it's possible that we end up with a disconnection from our toys. Uh, I'm pleasantly surprised by this part of the video. I fully thought this was gonna be like, you gotta get a bunch of guns and, and like get, get all the food and keep it for yourself and fuck your neighbors and stuff like that. No, it's good. That's pretty good. I like this. A uh, stronger connection. Can your sub baby be named Chad Thundercock? I'll leave that up to you. If you want to name a baby thundercock, I'm going to leave that to you. <laughs> and other human beings, uh, cautious and wiser reliance on technology, uh, and a greater love for the simple things of life, which is what life is really about. I think our modern age has been disconnected from the true values of life. And I think all of that could result on the other side of Y2K if we approach it the right way. I know that we did good patient care 25 years ago minus a lot of these very high-tech devices and we can do it again if should they fail in the year 2000. My view of it is is that it's an opportunity to redefine relationships 
that can emerge far stronger than what we've got today. I'm confident that we're <laughs> going to uh, rally around uh, uh, whatever the problems are, we will meet them as we have met all the other problems we've had, and that basically we will move forward and be uh, stronger uh, as a result of all of this work and effort. Finally, on the part where they're going to tell us tell us practical survival tips. By this time in the year 1999, the term Y2K has entered the public consciousness. World leaders in government, spiritual, and corporate circles have all found themselves in one of the greatest dilemmas facing humankind. What's the church supposed to do about 9/11? Or not 9/11? Y2K? 9/11 out of nowhere on the bingo card. That's my fault. We're not playing bingo. Joke. But the dilemma is not Y2K itself. Rather, the concern for world leaders is how we, as individuals, as communities, should best approach Y2K. But the reality is there are no Y2K experts. And this is because nothing like this has ever occurred before in the history of humankind. The reality is no one knows exactly what's going to happen. So. The real dilemma facing not only world leaders, but each one of us, is how to find a clear, reasonable, balanced approach between those who call for extreme survival measures versus those who advise no action at all. The very best we can hope to do, therefore, is to prepare as individuals and as families so that we each feel secure and to work together in small and large communities as local and global neighbors. That's the Y2K. I heard about it. Hi, I'm Ted Wright. I spent four and a half years in Special Forces, almost continuous combat. What is that? What? And I traveled from El Alamein in Rome. I was part Is Y2K going to attack me? Is it going to ambush me? Of the Desert Rats team. And I ended up at uh, outside Rome. And I survived Anzio. I have seen just about every condition of human. Do I think Peter would fall for this back then? I think if you showed him this tape now, there's like a 20% chance he'd think it's still a danger. <laughs> Misery and privation in my time. I am a family safety preparedness consultant. I've been doing what I do for 18 years. I'm happy to be a, a part of this team and I hope that uh, our message will be received positively. Concentrate on basic needs that you might have to spend a couple of weeks using those supplies before a distribution system is uh, renewed. I think it's a very important thing for uh, communities to have a constructive dialogue uh, with their elected leaders and their local uh, businesses about what- This guy sounds a little bit like a Kennedy. Their state of prepare. Oh, that was terrible. Please disregard every noise that came out of my mouth for the last 10 seconds. Wipe that from your brains. ...this is and what their state of readiness is. Learn how to put a little water away. Know how much per person to put away. Know uh, how much cash you're going to need on hand, if any. Know what you're going to do. Water, and I've said it yeah, for years, shaman. is going to be a prime problem in this country with regard... Y2K killed JFK is still on the run to this day. ...to fresh drinking water. It's already a problem now. It's been highlighted in newspapers, periodicals, magazines have all run specials on this. Have a minimum of at least four weeks water for each family member in storage as soon as possible. One gallon per person is accepted by FEMA and the Red Cross as the very basic requirement. So for one month, 30 gallons per person is your target. Jesus Christ, that's so much water. <laughs> Other than buying water, fill every container that you use. Milk, juice, soda pop, rinse it out and fill it with fresh tap water and store containers in a cool, dark place. 
I'd be so concerned the water would just go disgusting and stagnant. How often would you have to like switch it out to make sure that nothing's growing in it, you know? Because I am assuming that, you know, your kitchen isn't sterile. Um, hydrate. I have containers all over my house, all over my yard. I have them in the bedroom. I have them in the linen closet. Are we sure this guy is an expert? Store them, store them, store them. Fresh water properly stored lasts for years. The enemy of water is light and heat. Okay. We now have excellent technical advances that have resulted in very compact, portable, inexpensive water filters that we can process our water through and know that it's safe to drink no matter how long it's been in storage. If you're in doubt, filter the water using a good water filter now available in the uh, $30 range and up. Be sure it is at least a 0.05 micron or less because then it will filter out possible bacteria. I feel like this also isn't the, like, eventually you're going to run out of water filters, right? If Y2K was a thing. So you'd probably want to figure out how to boil it to, like, at least get some stuff out of it in terms of, like, bacteria. I don't know. Tea with Goblin says, I like this po I like this because um, it allows for the possibility that there may be changes that people need to adapt to, but none of them involve stockpiling guns and being paranoid about your neighbors. Like when winter comes, you're going to need warm clothes. Can't patch, spin yarn, knit, or sew? Better hope your neighbor down the street can. Mutual aid networks are worth more than guns. Agreed. Yeah, um... I agree too. I'm I'm surprised by this video in a positive way. I thought it was going to be the scaremongering stuff at the beginning was a bit much, but eh, that's the tape. I don't know what to tell you. At the very least, this is the advice, you know? It's good general, like, practical advice. Like, if you're in an area with natural disasters, which these days is almost everywhere, um, you know, it's not bad advice to have emergency water and stuff if anything happens. And hey, look at, like, these days, there have been multiple attacks on, like, power substations around the country, and people have been left without, like, electricity and water for long periods of time. Like, what are you going to do if that happens? You know? I don't know. I think it's a good idea to, you know think about stuff like this jillyfish thanks for 16 months have some but emergency you, supplies just in case if you can you have no filter and have doubts boil the stuff and now let's talk about storing water for purposes other than drinking picture this <coughs> you get up one day you go to the bathroom and discover you don't have water you then realize you only have one flush per toilet and then things are going to get nasty and unpleasant what do you do about this well, ahead of time, store water in volume for this purpose. Next to the need for drinking water, need for flushing water is number two. Fill trash cans, drums, or any large containers, no matter if they're clean or not. We're not talking about drinking water here. We're talking about toilet water. Quantity, not quality, is the order of the day. Think in rainy Silver areas, tea. put barrels under the gutter spout, and you have free water. Now, in most of the manuals put out by the Red Cross and FEMA, it tells you to put a plastic trash bag in your toilet and use the toilet normally, seal the bag when it's sufficiently finished. But that is one of the most destructive things we can possibly do, and I urge everybody, as I have done for years, do not use plastic bags for your toilet. As soon as you seal the bag, the waste inside starts to cook and that generates germs, it generates all sorts of bacteria. So those plastic trash bags are going to deteriorate and you- He is very intense about this. Does this man go door to door and warn people, don't shit in a bag! Don't shit in a bag! <laughs> Jay Rodimus with a link says this video is surprisingly all right, so I probably won't get to use this in a funny context, but I want to use it anyway because Leonard <laughs> Nimoy. This is bad comedy. <laughs> okay. You're going to. Argonian Bum says my fucking boyfriend about the plastic bags says use pillowcases. It's still gonna be. Not only is that's that's way worse. The poop will. It's permeable. Oh, God. To have a potential for an outbreak of disease like you never saw before. If the toilet doesn't work, a chemical toilet is the answer. 
the chemical toilet is most desirable for family safety. They are very affordable, costing even less than $60. If you cannot afford a... I don't know, like $60 in the 90s isn't nothing. What? El Monado says, I feel this man would turn to dust if he was informed about Jankum. Chemical toilet. Well, a good sized bucket and an adapted toilet seat will work if you're careful. Use this toilet and when finished, empty down the regular toilet. By observing the reaction of the flushing as you dump the homemade chemical toilet, you will learn how much water to keep in the bucket at all times. Under no circumstances dump the chemical toilet waste of any kind in the yard. Let's take the example of an apartment complex with 50 units in it. We have to get together, we have to put the responsibility on the owner or the management of the apartment buildings to make a communal toilet, to pull in the toilets that we see on the construction sites, etc. If people have to pay an extra dollar a month in their rent to make sure they have some toilets out there for them, like we do at uh, expositions and ball games, if they can do it for ball games and gatherings, we can do it for an apartment complex or condominium complex. I feel like this video is telling me to invest in porta potty companies. Not a bad call. Person people always got to poop. No hygiene is always a problem with no water. Stock up on baby wipes. Clean underarms and private areas daily with baby wipes. The next thing you want to do is really... Chiba Hawk says, just shit in your hands and throw it like a normal human. ...really get stuff that you eat, that you're used to eating, that will last into the year 2000. There's, uh, there's tons of things, such as tuna fish, potted meat, all kinds of potted... Holy shit, that guy really likes taco meat. He's got like... <laughs> I don't even know how many, I want to say gallons of taco meat, but you don't measure meat in gallons. I don't know how many big tubs of taco meat, but I saw one, two, three, four, at least five tubs of taco meat. Uh, meat products, bean products. If, if I, how do I put this? If I knew that all I had access to was probably a chemical toilet, I don't know if I would want to eat mainly taco meat. <laughs> from a can and beans. Product. I feel like that's a recipe for disaster. H. Baird says in the apocalypse, every day is Taco Tuesday. And so we're urging that people prepare food, water, other things for about a month to six weeks. The other aspect of that is that we're urging people strongly not to think that they can survive this alone. This is about community. It's about networks. And so beyond about a month, you have to be networked and you have to be in community. Uh, there's no way any one family could lay aside, you know, enough food, enough resources to survive this thing on their own. Community gardens. You need to have a minimum of four weeks of food for this emergency for each family member. Same as the water, remember? And also pets are family members. And that... I'm really glad it went that direction instead of a different direction that it could have gone after he said pets. They need food and water for the same period of time. The body needs a high concentration of protein and minerals to stay healthy. 50 to 60 grams of protein a day is a good guide and the average adult should consume this much protein. That is approximately 1500 grams of protein a month. If you have the time, a dehydrator is worth its weight in gold at this particular time. Homemade jerky can be stored... I mean, that just seems like a cool thing to have anyway. ...with white... Didn't know that was a thing. Can I just start dehydrating meats for fun? ...rice to absorb any extra moisture it may have... I could make so many charcuterie boards! ...after processing. Mary Bell's book on dehydrating food is a great resource if you want to try home dehydrating. We must learn the fundamentals and be like a squirrel. We must get a little bit and put it away, a little bit and put it away. In my own teachings, I teach the bin method. I, I talk about a 30 gallon trash bin, but it can be a smaller container. You need a container with a good tight lid that you can put food in once you have stored your protein, then work on storing other foods you will need. Here are some suggestions. Dried beans, rice, powdered milk, dried fruit, 
powdered protein drinks, alfalfa seeds for sprouting, and any canned foods you might like. If you have the money, MREs, meals ready to eat, can be purchased from military surplus stores. Or That's not a bad idea. I, have you guys seen that? I'm sure there are multiple channels but, that do this, but there's a particular guy that I've watched that tries MREs, both new and vintage. Very interesting. Like the, the entire process of creating foods that stay for a really long time without going bad and are small and portable and provide nutrition for people who are presumably doing a lot of physical work because they're made for the military. Very interesting. And on top of that, hoping that it tastes good so that they don't hate eating. <laughs> MH Dark Beast, thanks for 32 months, says, Howdy do, Hannah. Yet another month of my worship of your fine streams. So it turns out that the woman behind Velma and voices the character is a reactionary conservative and transphobe. So it seems it's fake woke to annoy people on both sides. I don't know if I'd call Mindy Calling a... She's certainly not right wing, but she's a rich turf liberal to my understanding. So. Mm. Tea with Goblin says... Um, ha ha ha, sorry, Mary Bell was the name of the youngest multiple murderer in modern English history. She killed too many pe two people at the age of 11, so the mention of the author's name made my true crime gremlin brain go, ah <laughs> Oh, God. Or from many sites on the internet. Um, and someone says, Steve, 1989, MRE Info, if so, great channel. Probably. The sooner you start your preparations, the better your opportunity to get the supplies you need at reasonable prices. Y2K specifically is going to affect our utilities and our services. We can't do anything about the telephone, we can't put the power back on, but we have to have alternate means of heating and alternate means of lighting. Fire. I'm just going to set everything on fire. That'll fix both now problems have for a very short period of time. With the subjects of food and water storage, let's move on to the problems of staying warm and having emergency lighting. If you have a fireplace or a wood stove and you don't have any fuel or you've run out of fuel, you can burn newspapers hand rolled into logs. Basically, you roll the newspapers very tightly and fasten them with metal wire. As for heat, a good modern kerosene heater is the way to go. They are safe, do need ventilation, of course, but are very efficient and economical. I will check out the under video 10 later. gallons a week, burning 10 hours a day. I stress the need to reduce the logistics. Don't try to heat the whole house. Select one room large enough for the family and use that one room for living in. For this four-week period, it's not that big a deal. There is a new, a long life flashlight, and boy, it's apart from all the rest. I have one, and it's just amazing. Mine will go two years on one battery. Candles are a pleasant but controversial light source. If you. I've never thought I'd hear that phrase. Um, Tea with Goblin says, Give a man a fire and he'll stay warm for a day. Set a man on fire and he'll stay warm for the rest of his life. Terry Pratchett. I love that man. Are going to use them. Be very, very careful, as they can be as dangerous as they are useful, especially around children. You may want to purchase an oil lamp from your favorite discount store. Oil lamps are one of the most economical ways to provide emergency lighting. Two gallons of lamp oil is approximately a month's supply using your oil lamp five hours a day. There is also the crank radio and light that is very, very efficient. Hot meal? Sure, if you want to. Keep warm? Why not? In a reduced living area. Be sure to stockpile plenty of the fuels you know you'll be using, such as firewood, kerosene, lamp oil, etc. You may want to have fire starter bricks and extra lighters available. Make sure you have plenty of batteries on hand for your flashlights. If you don't already have one, a fire extinguisher. You should have a good basic first aid kit. I have urged people for years, go to your doctor and ask for an extra prescription so you can cycle your prescriptions and have a month ahead of you. No doctor will issue a prescription ahead of time. We have to change the thinking of the AMA. Make sure you, you have your medication through the year 2000. Um, you'll want to make sure you get a 
perhaps filled in December of 19. This is one thing I like. My doctor, I get three months of my prescriptions at a time. So I always know, like, it's like when I get my prescriptions, I'm like, I have three months. It feels really nice. I don't know why. I used to run out a lot, but now that I have so much time, you know? That hopefully by three months from then, through January and February of 2000, as they work through the glitches, should there be a glitch, that by the time you're ready to fill your prescription in March, you'll have the computer system fixed and your medication will be um, available to you. And the medication problem, as far as I'm concerned, is a time bomb waiting to go off and it's going to be very, very serious. Make sure you have enough prescription medicine to last for this period of time. You will need to talk to your doctor about this. Home remedies and herbal teas. Have a good four-week supply of toilet paper, paper towels, lawn trash bags, diapers if you have a baby, feminine products, contact lens solution, and... I feel like if you had a baby and you were in a situation like this, cloth diapers would probably make more sense. Although I guess that guy's really concerned about the, the you know, <laughs> sanitary issue of poop, but you know, you clean cloth diapers, but if you don't have a washing machine, how efficiently can you clean a cloth diaper? Well enough probably because cloth diapers used to be the standard and that was before washing machines. I don't know. Good personal grooming items of your choice. You will need handy tools such as duct tape, a handsaw, crowbar, hammer and nails, pliers, screwdrivers and rope. Uh, you may want to put some money aside uh, because that uh, you may not be able to get to your bank. Your bank may be down uh, for a, a week or two and, and it would be a discomfort. You, I mean, you, to, people may not accept checks, uh, so having some cash might be a good idea. People don't usually understand the idea of fractional reserve banking, that when they make a deposit, only a very small portion is actually kept with the bank. Even of that deposit, only 1.2% of our total money supply is in cash. So that if everybody ran to the banks tomorrow, they'd only be getting maybe a penny on the dollar in return if they wanted in cash. Which is why the FDIC exists. Well, that kind of information floating around in the society is what's going to cause some tremendous panic, I think. It may be a good idea to have some cash on hand, although experts vary in their opinions. By personal choice, put coin and cash away as much as you feel you are comfortable with. Get a copy of all financial records such as bank statements, mortgage statements, credit card statements, and all important documents. Store them in a safe place. Have written proof of financial assets as much as you can. We do not recommend pulling all of your money out of the bank. Just document what is there. Tell your children they don't have to worry about Y2K because your family will be prepared if the water or electricity goes out for a few days. Uh, with children, it's very important to reassure kids that uh, this is not the end of the world. Involve them in a meaningful way. You know, if it comes to storing a little food or, you know, putting batteries in the flashlights, you, you give kids a meaningful role in the, uh, in the process because it literally is true that in times of catastrophe, everyone is a leader at one time or another. If your child is old enough to understand Y2K and to help out around the house, you need to explain Y2K to him. Let him help prepare. If the child is not old enough to help you or understand Y2K, then don't tell them. I mean, it'll be part of their life experience that they'll, children are pretty, pretty resilient. They'll, they'll figure this is normal. Be sure you have provided for your well-being and morale. Have games that require no electricity, books, playing cards, puzzles, and crafts. These will keep you and your children happily occupied. Tell your friends and relatives that preparing for temporary shortages and outages caused by Y2K is a good insurance policy. You don't expect your house to burn down, but you're still insured against that possibility. Now that you have seen some of the ideas in this program, you know how easy it is to start your own short-term preparations. Many people, especially those who live alone, are overwhelmed by the potential of this Y2K dilemma. Remember, all problems have a solution, and people will continue to work on the problems we have outlined in this presentation. 
If you would like more information about my educational materials regarding why to... Oh, uh, uh, he's trying to sell you more stuff. Okay. My newsletter or other products. Look at easy when you lay <laughs> the handbook. He bound it himself just with like printer paper. That's kind of cute. Please call 1-800. Ah, uh, <laughs> there we go. It's a sales pitch. I knew it. God damn it. That explains a lot of the fear mongering at the beginning. <laughs> He's going to sell you more stuff. 948-8301. This is definitely not his phone number anymore. It's been over 20 years. Do not call that phone number. It's probably a sex line now. I think that it's prudent uh, just as companies are planning. Or wait, were those 900 numbers? I don't know. For year 2000. So also is it prudent for individuals to engage in that same type of thinking. I'm going to buy a generator and a, at least a, enough of water for a month's supply, a month's supply of food. Basically, we're prepared for a couple of three months. I don't think it'll last that long, but it's not that expensive in 1999 prices early. I plan to do and uh, is to store a month's worth of food and, and, and a month's worth of water. I will make uh, my bank send me all my records. I'm keeping all my receipts for all of my medical expenses for the year 2000 or for the year 1999. Why don't you test yourself? Why don't every home test? Why not go home next weekend? Why not Friday night turn the box off, turn the electric off, go shut the water off, okay? Uh, have a few bucks in your pocket. Uh, see what you need. Y2K is a computer problem, but it's going to face the individual with their own reality. Whatever that reality is, it's going to face you face to face with a mirror. And in that mirror, there's going to be you. Here's a checklist to help you, your family, and your community prepare for Y2K. How many hours did Leonard know? Like, how long do you think this took to shoot? Not long. Letter Nimoy clearly just came in, kind of rough beard, and <laughs> sat down and read cue cards, but did it take three hours to shoot? How much did he get paid for three hours? It was probably like $50,000 or something stupid. UK. Do you have at least a three-week supply of water on hand? Do you have at least a three-week supply of food ready? Primarily canned and dried foods, which are not dependent upon refrigeration for freshness. Do you have hard copies of all your important documents, such as bank statements, stocks, assets, birth certificates, and so on? Do you have emergency independent lighting, such as flashlights, kerosene lamps, oil lamps, candles, and matches? Since Y2K will happen in the dead of winter, if you live in colder climates, do you have emergency heating methods or other means to stay warm? such as a well-prepared fireplace, at least three weeks of kindling, real or synthetic fireplace logs, as well as sleeping bags, heavy quilts, heavy coats, thick gloves, thermal underwear, and socks. Do you have backup cooking methods available, such as a kerosene camping stove, barbecue with ample supply of charcoal, or a fireplace and cookware appropriate for an open flame? If you are continuously reliant upon prescription medicine, have you made provisions with your doctor to have at least a three month supply of medicine after January 1st, 2000? Likewise. I wonder how many conversations happened like that. Hey doc, I came in, I was hoping I could get some meds in case Y2K happens. If you have a medical condition which requires continuous care, have you made provisions with your doctor to make sure your necessary medical care will be uninterrupted? throughout the year 2000. Do you have a first aid kit? And have you customized it for the potential needs of you and your family? If you have critical care home nursing equipment, have you checked with the seller or manufacturer to make sure that none of the equipment may be affected by Y2K microchip failure? If you'll be pregnant in the year 2000, have you made special provisions with your doctor to ensure a smooth delivery of your newborn child? In the event that telephone systems, satellite networks, television, or radio temporarily become inoperative. <laughs> Texas listened to this, that's why their power grid is perfect. Honestly, just 
dub over some of this and repackage this, cut out the first half about Y2K and package the second half about surviving without water and electricity and sell it to modern Texans. Do you or your nearby neighbors oh. have a ham radio as a backup for communications and to keep abreast of newsworthy developments? Have you made specific plans to secure heirlooms and other valuables important to you and your family? Have you contacted your local phone, water, and power companies, both about uninterrupted service and about accurate billing statements in the year 2000? If you live in a skyscraper or other high-rise dwelling, have you and your co-tenants conferred with building management regarding backup generator for the entire building? regarding emergency provisions for heat, light, water, and waste management. If you live in a community of neighborhood homes, have you begun organizing with family, friends, and town leaders to prepare contingency plans for the first two to three months of the year 2000? Particularly- This is a lot of stuff to do, I agree. This is why if society collapses, I've already, I'm, I'm, I'm checking out. <laughs> I barely exist. I can barely survive in society. And man, it's really easy. <laughs> you know? Things collapse. Not worth it. Not worth it. Regarding emergency food, water, and heat provisions. Have you made special contacts with any elderly or disabled folks to see if they could use a little help? And have you communicated with your local, county, state, and federal representatives to make sure they're doing everything in their power to prepare for Y2K. Finally, one good thing to remember regarding all of these items of preparation is that regardless of what may or may not occur as a result of Y2K, all of these things will still be useful to you and your family. And the efforts to organize with our neighbors will be beneficial to all parties concerned, no matter what does or does not happen. Tea with Goblins says, My 13th birthday was December 31st, 1999. I remember no one really took this shit seriously, but my goodness, everything was silver. We thought it was going to click over to 2000 and suddenly we're all going to live in the music video for TLC's No Scrubs, which remains a banger, by the way. <laughs> There is an ancient myth of what might have been the most highly advanced civilization ever to dwell on the planet Earth. But that is indeed just an ancient myth. We are now, without question, living in one of the greatest periods in all human history. It's both an exciting and challenging time. Uh, Cashel Gladio says some of the projects that some really talented Star Trek actors were willing to do for a paycheck is really bizarre. Yeah, I mean... I don't think the 90s were a great time for the original cast of Star Trek. Like, obviously, like, Star Trek was in a, a golden age, you know, in the 90s with Next Gen and Deep Space Nine, but I don't know. I don't remember, like, William Shatner and, like, Nimoy and stuff getting, you know, clout based on that. I don't know. <laughs> Much less, like, ones that weren't in the main three, you know, Nichelle Nichols and all that. I don't think they got any roles in the 90s. Um, Stone Corbell says, remember that time Kate Mulgrew was tricked into doing the voiceover for that geocentrism documentary? I do. I do remember that. That was funny. <laughs> to be alive. We both enjoy and are awestruck by the unbelievably rapid advancements in human ingenuity and technology. Yet, how fragile do we now find ourselves before the juggernaut of our own inventions? However, as we indicated earlier in this program, there are no Y2K experts. No one knows exactly what, if anything, will happen. And our individual and collective response to Y2K is actually far more important than Y2K itself. The experts that we're dealing with uh, indicate that it's going to hit hard and heavy for a while, maybe, be, maybe look like what some are calling a meltdown scenario for a week or two, and then it's going to level out more to brown out. On a scale of one to five, how bad the Y2K is going to be globally, five being the worst, I would say globally they're at a five. In the States, we have been at a four. I think we're going to end up about a two.
my personal sense of this is uh, in the range of three. I think there are going to be major disruptions. I think there are going to be uh, things that uh, we can deal with, but it won't. Were there literally any disruptions? Genuinely. I don't know. I know nothing big happened, obviously, but like, did any minor, like, did a, did a company somewhere have issues? You know what I mean? Or did they completely fix this? It'd be easy. Putting January 1 on a scale of 1 to 5, with 5 being the worst and 1 being nothing at all, my assumption is somewhere around a 2.5. Again, an annoyance, a nuisance, a lot of different things that don't work. Catastrophic? I don't think so. I would say a 3. I, I think maybe we're looking at maybe a 3. I think, based on the utility companies, I think there will be some power outages or we'll have brownouts in some cases. I would say that it would probably fall around a, a three or a four. My personal opinion is it can only be a five. It can't be any less than a five. <laughs> that, um, video store rent records had problems? Well, that's an issue, obviously. <laughs> I would probably have to rate this right in the middle at two and a half. And the reason is because we know that this is an inevitable circumstance. I would put the year 2000 problem for the world at a three with a wait and see attitude. In a very real way, we're all responsible for Y2K and there's no one to blame, morally or otherwise. We've all benefited from the technologies which have improved our lives and we have therefore encouraged those same technologies to develop at ever more accelerated rates. And yes, perhaps we are now realizing that we've taken them a bit for granted and have indeed become too dependent upon the byproducts of our collective innovations. And so, we must not only prepare as families and work together as neighbors, but we need also use this moment in the development of our civilization as an opportunity to look at the long range effects of all our human endeavors. Looking beyond Y2K, Whatever perils our very human ambitions and short-sightedness may lead us to, our even more powerful human spirit will find a way to overcome. So, let us use the Y2K challenge as an opportunity to reflect on where we're headed as a civilization, perhaps the most important opportunity we've ever had. If the omission of two simple digits can have worldwide impact several decades after its inception, we must ask ourselves, before we rush too far forward, what are we doing now in genetic engineering? With cloning, with the development of bacteriological warfare life forms, with death ray technologies, what? and pollution of land, air, and water that could have long-term, unpredictable worldwide effects. And what can we do as the inheritors, the caretakers of this world? What can we do to protect our home, our island, in space. Well, now we're prepared. When Y3K happens and we'll all be alive, obviously, then we'll know what to do. Mm. I have a written statement. Um, a few nights ago, I accidentally killed Tim Allen. Uh, H. Baird says weird computer problems can in fact cause major problems. Radio station snafu in Seattle bricks some Mazda infotainment <laughs> systems. Oh God. And now I'm becoming Tim Allen. You're thinking, no, you killed Santa Claus and now you're becoming Santa Claus. No, I killed Tim Allen and I am becoming the Tim Allen. It's a... Sorry. I found him after having hit him and all he had on him was his NRA ID card and a note that said, if something should happen to me, take my gun. Jay Leno will know what to do. Oh, oh, oh. He's a college virgin. 
sorry. Something important to know about this is the Tim Allen I killed is not the original Tim Allen. The original Tim Allen was killed in a Kalamazoo jail in 1978 after he had been arrested possessing over a pound of cocaine. That Tim Allen was killed by someone in that jail. I don't know why. You don't just know it. You don't just inherit his entire backlog. You have to figure it out. What's it like being Tim Allen? I have a family. I have a wife, a hot daughter, and another daughter. I now have to attend weekly men's meetings. Just a group of men, and you go, you're a good boy, you're a good boy, and you're a good boy, over and over. Oh, oh, oh. I have a penis. And you're a good boy, and you're a good boy. These things just come to me now. I just say them over breakfast with my wife and my one hot daughter. I didn't set out to kill Tim Allen and become the Tim Allen. I was just, I was out in West Hollywood going shot for shot with Andy Milanakis. Couldn't keep up with him. This guy's crazy. Actually, somehow we're on the PCH. Something jumps out of the road, and we think it's like it's, we try to swerve, but we can't. And then all of a sudden, we just it, 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 it hits, and it's just Ram Funk Railroad. Now that music. The guy knows he's in love when he loses his interest in his car for a couple of days. Oh, oh. Woke up one morning knowing what Wilson looks like. And after I hit Tim Allen, I did not want to look at my 2009 Hyundai Elantra. Please respect my privacy at this time. I have a sitcom that I think is still on air. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh. <laughs> well, all right then. You can just strap. Baja, thanks for 32 months. I am your captain, and we have now reached cruising altitude. So uh, you can just strap in and relax. Uh, should be a pretty smooth flight. We will reach New York on time. However, there will be a little bit of turbulence over the rock. <laughs> oh, we really did it. Mountains, but nothing to be concerned about. Please just use your safety belts. Otherwise, <laughs> basically smooth sailing the whole way through. Excuse me. You... <laughs> He's actually doing whippets for the video. Can't do drugs and fly a plane. How do you know? You tried it? You just can't. It's against the law. Are you fed? What? Or just a snitch? No, it's not safe. It's not safe. Wiener. <laughs> yeah, you're right. He is a wiener. You didn't just see the pilot doing drugs? It's not doing drugs. It's just whippets. It's whippets. <laughs> Nerny, thanks for 18 months, is basically smooth sailing the whole way through. Oh, this uh, sub baby's gonna be Whippets Johnson. It's fine. Well, you can't be drunk. He had one beer. It's actually my fifth beer. You know, it's just beer, it's not liquor. I haven't had liquor since this morning. You have a high tolerance, I'm sure. Can we go? I'm the best drunk pilot you know. Did the co pilot fly the plane? Darren? He's been blacked out for hours, dude. <laughs> Plus, these things basically fly themselves. Oh my god, no one's flying the plane. Did you not just hear him? He said that there's a computer flying the plane. These things just fly themselves. I'll go back into the cockpit like a freaking Wright brother. <laughs> Did you just say Wright brothers? Dude, what a deep cut. You're like Dennis Miller, my man. I love Dennis Miller. He's one of my biggest influences in flight. He's a huge influence on me being a passenger. You want to see a trick? Brick. Oh. For my next trick, barrel rolls. Barrel roll. Oh. Strap in. Oh, please get me off this plane. Anybody down to make a pit stop in Vegas? No, oh, please. I have to go to New York. I have to see my estranged wife. You're going to like Vegas. They have gambling there. Please, I bought a ticket to New York. I just want to go to New York. Yeah, and now you're getting a free trip to Vegas. Stop complaining. You're cool AF. Uh, you want to see the cockpit? Why do they call it that? You're about to find out. <laughs> Tea with Goblin says, I've never heard of them being called whippets before. Here we call them nangs, bulbs, or my personal favorite, floor chimes. There was a few minutes of screaming after that, but uh, it basically ends there. Can't believe it. The pilot was doing whippets. So, it's just whippets. Well, he was drunk too. Let's just put down terrorism and call it a day. Nice. 
In what many are calling a miracle on the strip, a commercial jet has crash landed into the fountain of the Caesars Casino. The FBI reports that a tragedy was averted due to the heroic actions of the pilot as well as assistance from a brave passenger. <laughs> Citosaurus says, I thought I was going to die doing whippets once. I was doing it out on, out of a balloon and all of a sudden couldn't take in a breath and my lungs felt heavy. It was terrifying, but that didn't stop me from doing more. Like 10 minutes later, I made a smart decision in my 20s. Uh, disclaimer, don't do whippets or any illegal drugs. According to an Or things that are bad for you. Official this is a family channel. Or a terrorist attack was thwarted when the pilot did a barrel roll. Maneuver. Families are celebrating tonight <laughs> as the emergency crash landing resulted in Sorry. only one casualty. We remember Thomas Wiener Sullivan with a 21 Whippet salute. <laughs> one. Two. Three. You want in on this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. I was saying you could tell that the guy was really doing it earlier because you could tell she wasn't doing it and the like the voice was digitally changed. Don't do whippets. Okay. Guys, this is important information. If you ever find yourself in a time machine of some kind and you wind up back in the 70s and you need to work at a showbiz pizza, here's how you run a children's party at a showbiz pizza. We make pizza good and we make pizza fun. Now, here's how we make birthdays special. The party line is your first step toward that special day. In the multiple market areas, we will continue to rely upon the existing central reservation system to book parties. For you single market areas, select one person to answer the phone and be your booking agent. That one person will be your direct link with the public. Watch. With a good party line... Chuck E. Cheese actually didn't buy them out. I'm pretty sure Showbiz bought Chuck E. Cheese, but they decided to brand everything to Chuck E. Cheese. I don't know why. Might have been the stronger brand for some reason. Your profits will get bigger. <laughs> Awkward zoom in. Okay, cut. Cut. What are you going to do for Johnny's birthday? I can't think of a thing, but I would like it to be something special. Oh, yes, a birthday he'll remember. <laughs> Our human child requires entertainment on the anniversary of the day that they came out of you. Indeed! Hey, Johnson, it's your birthday! That's right, Tommy! This is the TV spot. It's in use, and it's already building demand in your area. a special birthday gift. But wait, Tommy, that's not all. A birthday song just for you, performed by the one and only Rock of Fire Explosion. Pretty neat, huh? At Showbiz, we make pizza good and we make pizza fun. It's a clunky tagline. Now that's what we need, Showbiz Pizza Place. Of course. Should have just said we make pizza fun. Of course, why didn't I think of that before? I'll give them a call right now. <laughs> of that before okay so this is the importance of backing tracks for your audio you just want a bass because <laughs> then you get awkward insert shots with no audio like we need show like there's background audio here that should be placed over the upcoming insert shot so it's not so jarring you can hear the background noise listen this pizza play background of course, why didn't i think of that before I'll give them a call right now. Mute. 
<laughs> like all the background noise is gone. Creepy. Showbiz Pizza Place Party Line. A successfully handled party line is that next most important step. When the customer calls for the information, be sure your operator is courteous, accurate, and helpful. Be sure the personal attention their party will receive is mentioned, as well as the food and drink included. Inform them of the table setting that comes with each party, and be sure to tell them what gifts their child can take home with them. Now, all these party line procedures are provided in the new birthday package. Look for them and use them. As you can see here, the table has been set for a birthday party. Take note of the throne and crown for the guest of honor. Also, note the activity created by your people. This attention to detail, this creation of a party atmosphere from the outset, is essential for the third step. Make everyone at the party feel special. The host and hostess are there to keep things running smoothly and to make sure everyone is having a good time. Everybody at Showbiz wants to wish you a very happy birthday, Johnny. Yeah. Wow, thank you. This is the best birthday ever. Well, Johnny, you haven't had that many yet, so I don't know if you're an expert. Well, it's not over yet. Here you go. Where's his Dick the Birthday Boy shirt? Oh. Are you telling me that wasn't part of the experience? Wow. <laughs> Listen, you can take that home with you today. Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. I have a surprise for you. Look, here's a hug from Billy Bob. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. What we are showing you here are only a few ways your people can manufacture fun. They can lead the singing of the happy birthday song, make a big deal of showbiz's present, they can even talk to the children. And don't forget about the picture they take of the guest of honor with Billy Bob. It's a real treat for the parents. Remember that each party is a special event. Use your imagination. For no more time than you are spending now for a birthday party, you can create something special where everyone is having a good time and you are making more money. <laughs> Uh, Stonecore Bell says, I like how we cut away to a one-second shot of that girl in a nightmare dimension making more money. Showbiz now makes birthday special, and you make showbiz. You are only a few steps away from a successful party. After all, a birthday is just an ordinary day, unless the party is at showbiz. Well, now we know how to run a birthday party at a <laughs> goddamn showbiz pizza. Oh, what else are imp what other important skills can we learn? And now displays with Jake. Hi, I'm Jake. I've put together a little film to show you some of our displays. Follow me. This is the Nintendo Power Previews display. Works a lot like a jukebox. You walk up, you push a <laughs> Does it? button, and it plays the game that you've selected. Sometimes you need to adjust the volume on this. To do that, you take your key number 2007, go underneath the keypad, and open up the keypad, and then drop down the front door. You'll find two different buttons here. One of them adjusts the attract mode volume, while the other one will adjust the volume of the game that you just selected. You may also see another version of this that's 30 inches wide. Now, we've got a lot more to look at, so let's go take a look at those. <laughs> there you are. This is the Super NES Floor Interactive. I want to go into this place. I don't know where this is, but I just want it. There's so, it's like a limit it's like liminal space but also nostalgia. 
foggy 90s nostalgia. I want to be in that place so bad. Display. You can play some really cool Super NES games on this thing. Sometimes you want to change those games out. To do that, take your key marked LL419 on your really cool Mario Paint key ring and open it up by unlocking the lock on the side. And that'll flip the cover up. Open 30 it. inches in one TV, right? Who needs a 30 inch TV? Cover, turn off the power. That's still less than, that's, that's under half of the size of my main TV. <laughs> Push down on your eject button and that'll pop up the game pack. Take out the game pack cartridge, take your new game pack cartridge, put it into the slot, push down firmly. Be sure to turn your power back on and then close and lock your cover. They're working at a video game store, but they don't know how to put a game in Super Nintendo. Now, sometimes you want to... An 85 inch TV would be great. Honestly, the, the size isn't as important as I've had the same TV for like many years. And someday I want to get a TV that has high dynamic range, which I do not have. So it's less about the size. I just want a TV that has high dynamic range so I can fully enjoy the 4K Blu-rays I have. But that's years away. So. I'm gonna change the volume on this as well. To do that, we have to run around to the side here. Because right now I have like a 65 inch TV, I think. Maybe it's 70, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's 65 though. Um, and I'm fine with the size, but it would be nice if it had HDR. The side panel will open up if you take the same key and open the lock on the back of the display. Open up that lock, open the side panel, and if you look right down here, you'll see a little blue block with little teeny tiny switches on it. Right above that is a little thing that looks like a screw head. Take the screwdriver you got in your kit and turn that little screw head one way or the other to adjust the volume. Me, I like the volume up really high. Hey, does this look familiar? This is just like the other unit we just saw. When yeah, this is some sort of Nintendo vendor video for people who get these like trial, try it kiosks. The countertop version. The inside workings are just like the other one, so I'm not gonna bother showing you that. I do wanna show you how to set the volume on this one and that's around the other side. Come over here and again, we look for that little blue block where the timer settings are made and look for the little screw head driver adjustment right above that. Be sure to put in your screwdriver and you know me, I like it up real loud. Hi again. Let's talk about some Game Boy displays. First, we've got the Game Boy Counter Interactive Display. Here, you've got your cool Game Boy with amplified stereo sound. Now on this display, you want to change out the game pack and or adjust the volume. To do that, let's go to the back of the display. In the back, take your key marked MM101, unlock the back door, open it all the way up, and inside you'll see the top end of your Game Boy here. I wonder how much these kiosks sell for nowadays, because I'm sure they're collector items for like old school Nintendo fans. Use the cartridge, be sure to turn the volume on your Game Boy off, push up on the game cartridge, and lift it out, and then take your, the game cartridge that you want to replace, and, and put it in with the label facing down, press firmly into the Game Boy, don't forget to turn the power back on, and you're ready to play your new game. <clears throat> now, adjusting the volume. Let's move to the left-hand side over here. You'll see a, a funny little electronic board with a bunch of little things like legs and, you know, bugs with legs and stuff. And right up here, you've got a little uh, shaft sticking out with a rubber grommet on it. That's your volume control. Take that and turn it up to make it louder or down to make it quieter. And don't forget, always close and lock your displays. <clears throat> Next, we'll talk about this unit here. Another great Game Boy Interactive with a Game Boy mounted right in here. Superb stereo amplified sound. But in this one, we've added some really cool special electronics so that we can watch the game being played on a TV screen. That's honestly rad. Now here, we don't have to get into the back of the display. To change the game cartridge or adjust the volume, we simply open the front panel by using your MM101 key again. Turn the key, the front panel flips down. Inside, at the top of your Game Boy, just like we did a minute ago, don't, you can turn the power off and pull your game cartridge out to change it. To put a new one in, don't forget, label has to be down. Insert that into the back of the Game Boy, turn your power back on, and you're ready to play. Adjust
Take it and turn your volume up or down, and you're all set. Don't forget, close the door and lock it. This is the most viewed part okay, of the video, and I wondered why. Boy side. Again, this is all part of this one great display. And, and one more time, we put those really, really special electronics in here so you can see the game on the TV screen. The Game Boy down here. I hope that man is doing well in the future. <laughs> Dealing with angry customers. When will Gem fall into the public domain? Probably after I'm dead, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Like stuff from 1927 just went into the public domain and Gem came out in the 80s, so. Hello? Maybe I won't be dead, but I'll be too old to be doing this. <laughs> Does anybody work here? What is this, self-service? Hello? Hello, I'm Jay Taylor, and I'm here to help you deal more effectively with angry customers. Now, we all know that it's customers who keep your company in business, and your job is to satisfy as many as you possibly can because, well, let's face it. Keeping customers is just as important as getting them. Angry customers can be internal or external, face-to-face -face or over the telephone. The way you deal with them is the same. So, how do you deal with angry customers? Oh, hi. Sorry to keep you waiting. My name is Paul. How may I help you? I don't know. You tell me. I am Mrs. Decker. I bought these shoes last week to wear to my daughter's wedding. This morning I tried them on, and before I could walk to the mirror, the heel broke. Now, the wedding is Saturday. My dress is fine. The shoe is dead. I am sick and tired. First, deal with the person's feelings. Apologize that the situation... Isn't it great that we live, like, in a world where we have to have training videos? to explain how to deal with the emotions of other adults. <laughs> Here's how you manage the emotions of an adult who wants to yell at you like they're a child. Situation occurred. Mrs. Decker, uh, can we come over here and discuss this, please? Uh, you must be upset. I'm really sorry this happened. Your being sorry doesn't put new shoes on my feet. Put yourself in your customer's place. Listen to the whole story without interrupting. Maintain eye contact. Nod your head. Show the customer you're really listening. Until they're calm, they won't even hear you. I think you should probably just say, ma'am, I'm not gonna, s like this is a very 90s, 80s customer service video. Here's how it should go in real life. Ma'am, I'm here and I work here, but I'm not gonna deal with you if you're gonna yell at me. If you wanna talk to me like an adult, I'm happy to handle your issue. I'm sure we can find a replacement shoe for you. There's no issue, but I'm not gonna be talked to like that. And if you're going to, you need to leave the store. What kind of place is this? No one cares about quality anymore. I know, and I'm going to do everything I can to correct the situation. Now, whatever you do, don't let the customer make you defensive. She's angry at the situation, not you. Now a lot of people are shitty and get angry at people who have nothing to do with the situation, actually. What you want to do is focus the anger. Ask questions. Questions help control the dialogue and get you the information you'll need later on to solve the problem. It just makes me furious. I'd be too, Mrs. Decker, and I'm sure we can work it out. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Hurry up, the wedding is Saturday. This'll just take a minute. 
Uh, now, when did you buy the shoes? By any chance, do you have the receipt? Tuesday, and yes! Oh, I see you bought these on sale. That's true. But so what? They're still no good. You can't sell customers lousy shoes just because they're on sale. I'm tired of this. All right. You've gotten the dialogue started. You understand the customer's feelings. Now, reflect those feelings back to the customer. Give feedback. You know, I can just imagine how frustrating this must be. <laughs> oh, mirroring. Good. See, I mean, with all you have to do to get ready for your daughter's wedding, you certainly don't want to have to go around returning shoes. I do have one or two more things to do. Now, summarize the facts, just to be sure you've understood them correctly. You bought these shoes on Tuesday. You tried them on for the first time today. They broke, and you need them by the end of the week. And since they're a sale item, you're worried about their being returnable. Well, they're certainly not wearable. Let's just take a moment to see where we are. You have dealt with the customer's feelings. You've apologized that the situation occurred. <laughs> Tiggs reflect those feelings back at the customer literally and starts yelling at her. Empathized. You've asked Good questions. strategy. You've given feedback. And you've summarized the situation. Now it's time to deal with the customer's problem. Step number one. Find out exactly what the customer wants you to do. I want you to give me my money back. Of course, sometimes you can't do exactly what your customer wants. If that's the case, then you should explain what you can do. Suggest alternate solutions, and then try to reach agreement. Uh, Mrs. Decker, I wish we could give you a cash refund, but since the shoes were purchased on sale, we can't do that. But here's what we can do. We can exchange them for another pair. We can give you a credit slip. If this is a real customer, they wouldn't have let him continue talking. They would have, they would have immediately, when he said, I can't give you a cash refund, started yelling at you again. <laughs> I worked at Toys R Us like 10 years ago. Or we can repair them for you at no expense. Now that might be your best way to go since you need the shoes for the wedding. Uh, which would you prefer? Can you repair them today? We can send them out on a rush for you. My st I'll have you know, my stupid career of being a shit poster online for a living has lasted and outlived Toys R Us. So, quitting that job was a good choice. We'll have them back the day after tomorrow, which should be plenty of time for you. Paul's doing the right thing here. He's sharing information with the customer about his procedures. This helps him get agreement on a course of action. All right. Now you're absolutely sure they'll be here the day after tomorrow. They'll be here 9 a.m. sharp, I promise. Please ask for me when you come in to pick them up. Thank you, I, I, I will. Well, thank you, Mrs. Decker. And again, I'm really sorry this happened. So we'll see you the day after tomorrow. Bye now. Thank you again. That situation was well handled. The customer was obviously angry, and the service rep was able to diffuse her anger and solve the problem. But what about those times when your customer is internal, someone you work with at the next desk or in the next department? That's not a customer. What? That's a, that's another employee or a neighbor. <laughs> that's the only part of the video that's, that's uploaded. That's it, that's the end of it. So I guess we don't get to find out. <laughs> <sighs> Why are, like, all the Wendy's training videos, like, the weirdest ones? Your job calls them internal customers? Oh, God. story about a dude like me i love cooking french fries that you all might eat i make them nice and hot and guaranteed to please when everybody strolls up inside my wendy's you can have them as a side or even up in a combo all the people want to 
eating my fries. I know. I do them up right now. You about to learn how I ensure the highest quality without the burn. First, I change the pad, test the oil with the strip. Every morning, I make sure the oil is fit. Fill the fridge with the fries that I need through the rush. Stock my fry station purpose so it's ready for lunch. To serve my taste in crispy golden fries. And to salt them to perfection is my goal this time. I gotta make sure everything's done just right. Cause everybody up at Winnie's got an appetite. Come on. Always taste the perfect fries. I feel like Wendy's used to have really good fries and then they changed them and now they're not good. The same thing happened to Burger King. In the line. I drop the baskets in the oil, yo, two at a time. <laughs> Shut up and take your bits. And Thank you. In the right. But never double in the kettle, it will color them right. Never overfill the basket, I use just the third. From the bottom to the fill line, so you can be sure that you're cooking them right for us all to enjoy. The ones that don't meet our quality, well, those are destroyed. If they're soggy in the bit, uncooked ends and dark tint. Never mix the new with the old, never use them in cold. The new fresh french fries are the ones to be sold. So if they minute you're a small, and after seven minutes, y'all, I only pre stage my fries daily during the lunch to keep them fresh for the late night and midday rush. Let's go. Always the KFC french fries have chicken seasoning now. Sounds good. What else? What else? Wait, why is Vincent Price in a training video? Oh, it's for Sears. This must be an old one. How old is this? 1962? Downshift or drown shift, rather. So perhaps some of you are wondering what I'm doing carrying around a stepladder. Well, let me assure you, I was hanging pictures and not people. Those <laughs> of you who know that I have another interest besides movies, and that's an interest in Vincent Van Gogh fine arts. And some of you may have read in the papers that Sears is starting a, a department, a section. Hold on, I can turn this up a little more. He's still coloring a little quiet. Of fine arts. But before I tell you about this, let me go back about three months ago and tell you how it all started. George Struthers and Frank Stover came out to Hollywood one day and asked me if I would be interested in making a collection for the fine art section of uh, 621. <laughs> you see, I'm already catching on to your language. Well, I was tremendously excited by this challenge because I have always felt that the fine art should be brought to the people, to the great numbers of people around this country, 
And suddenly... I don't understand why Vincent Price is involved in this at all. Tea with Goblin says, I think a better question would be why isn't Vincent Price in all training videos? Imagine getting hired at Maka's and it's the dapper gentleman teaching you to flip burgers with his signature sinister yet camp charm. Fun fact, at McDonald's you don't actually flip burgers. The grill is double-sided. It presses down. You don't have to flip them. I was presented with the opportunity to do it. In the company that represents more people than any other company in America, and that probably has contact with more American people than any other company. So uh, a lifelong desire of mine was fulfilled, and I was given a, a white card, a carte blanche to go ahead and form a collection of fine art that Sears could back up with their great guarantees of quality or your money back, and to make it as exciting to you all and to the public. So I accepted the challenge, and I started making a collection of fine arts. Also, I met up with a fellow out in California who worked with me in the Sears store there named Chuck Pearson, who told me a great deal about Fine art Sears. at Sears? Sears was a big deal back in the day. Sears was like Sears was like a, a like a department. It was America's department store. They were everywhere, and you get all sorts of home goods here. So, and what the customers like, what they are like, all kinds of people available. Jesus, it's I'm just sure seventeen minutes of him talking about art. Every cent. Now, when you come, Sears was Amazon back in the day. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Yeah. That's loud. Welcome to Blockbuster Video. Blockbuster Video gives you over 10,000 videos to choose from in over 30 different categories. And with our new Blockbuster Movie Previews video, you can sample the excitement of up to 50 Blockbuster videos at a time, absolutely free. Where do clairvoyants buy their crystal balls? From the Sears catalog. While Boo. viewing at home, just use the rental reminder card we've included with the previews cassette to list the movies you want to rent and their categories. Keep it in your wallet next to your Blockbuster membership card. Then the next time you're at Blockbuster Video, the movies you've listed will be easy to remember and find. Just check the movies off as you rent them. That's it's weird. Blockbuster Video's way of making it simple and con kind of funny. It's like the analog version of your <laughs> queue or your list on streaming services. Convenient for you to be selective in choosing movies for your entire family. Now let Blockbuster Video sneak you into the movies. Blockbuster Video, one of the largest video superstore chains in the country, offering you a Blockbuster selection of over 10,000 videos in over 30 categories. And the membership's always free. They're still in Saginaw, where I used to live. There's still, there used to be a Blockbuster. And last I checked, the Blockbuster closed like 15, 20 years ago, of course. But the Blockbuster sign is still out front. Like a full, on a big pole, giant Blockbuster sign. This three-dimensional fucking Blockbuster sign. And I want to find out who owns it and buy it so bad. <laughs> Old Sickback says, can we get Vincent Price some more money so he doesn't have to do this? Good news! <laughs> he does not need money anymore. For those special movies that you want to retain. It's still there? All right, someone steal me the Blockbuster sign. <laughs> I don't know where I'll put it, but I want it. Permanently in your videotape library, Blockbuster Video is your superstore. We have a large selection of the latest, the biggest, and the best movies for sale at special Blockbuster prices. For either rentals or sales, Blockbuster Video is the hottest movie ticket in town. Blockbuster Video offers a great selection of kids' videos, 
as well as a youth-restricted viewing program that <coughs> labels movies inappropriate for viewers under 17 and provides computerized enforcement. You decide what kind of videos you want your children to watch, and Blockbuster Video... My kids are allowed to watch Robocop at age three. It's fine. Video. It'll build character and teach them that capitalism is evil. <laughs> it's important to learn from a young age. Enforces your wishes. Blockbuster Video sincerely hopes that this volume of our movie previews video has been helpful in selecting... Do I have any dead malls in my area? Uh, Saginaw has a dead-ass mall. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Just the right videos for every member of your family. All we ask is that you return it as soon as you've written down the movies you want to rent, so other families can use it as you have. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> oh, God. <sighs> Lots of Chuck E. Cheese ones. Yeah, we did training videos. Let's we should do some infotainment videos. They say They say No, that's great! We're trying to cough up enough for a drink! <laughs> oh yeah, that's a don't smoke video. <laughs> <laughs> Nine and a half when I started smoking. Youth use of tobacco was on the decline, and then they made it fruit flavored. People buying for me, or I, I get them from my brother or my cousin. Before you rush it, you get up, you light a cigarette, it's like, oh. I, get, I get high up a cigarette. You can't get high No, like a little bit. All of a sudden, I needed a cigarette. It's only been two hours, but... We need the cancer sticks. I like to smoke. If I die from smoking, I die. And now it's time for Bust! A brand new game show that reveals some shocking facts about cigarettes! <laughs> Who's ready to play Bust? We are! What'd you say? I can't hear you! Oh god, that guy later went on to be in the show House. We are! And what are you waiting for? Come on, busters! Into those smoke booths now! Okay, blue team! What kills more people in the U.S. today? Car accidents or tobacco products? Car accidents! Wrong! Tobacco kills ten times more people than car accidents. Wow. It's gonna get a little smoky in there, blue team. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's a lot. Red team. Huh? I mean, that's the statistic is probably different now, but still. H Bird says in high school you could tell which kids smoked because they would constantly put their pens in their mouths and unconsciously smoke them. I do that. I did that a lot too. I, 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 it, it, mm. I, I, I'm trying to say this in a way that isn't gonna make people go phrasing. Some people just like to... There's no way I can phrase it. Never mind. Point retracted. h -birds. God damn it. How many kids start smoking every day? 300 or 3,000? 3,000? Correct! Way to go, Red Team! And now, Blue Team! Tell me about those 3,000 kids who start smoking every day. How many of them are gonna die as a result? Is it 100 or 1,000? Uh, 100? Wrong! The correct answer is 1,000. One out of three kids who start smoking is gonna die because of it. Guess they should have thought of that, shouldn't they? Blue team, you've earned yourselves another blast! <laughs> Red team, we've got ammonia used to clean toilets, cyanide used to kill rats, 
and formaldehyde used to preserve dead frogs. Where do we find all these ingredients? Underneath the kitchen sink. Well, <laughs> I can't say what you It's an oral fixation. Is that a real thing? Or was that like a bullshit thing Sigmund Freud made up? You have underneath your kitchen sink, but that's not the answer we're looking for. No! You find all these poisonous chemicals in every breath of cigarettes smoke you in hell! New team. You're dizzy, anxious, can't concentrate. You feel like biting someone's head off! All you can think about is smoking cigarettes. What's your problem, anyway? Nicotine withdrawal. That's right. <laughs> Those are just a few symptoms of a cigarette junkie trying to kick the addiction. Way to go, blue team. Maybe these guys aren't such losers after all. In my opinion, I want them to legalize underage smoking. We did learn how to survive Y2K. It was actually better than we thought. It was basically develop a community <laughs> and learn to work together. It was good. Yeah. Why? Because it's hard. Because time. it's hard. We know it's gonna happen to us. We know how sick it makes us. We've seen people die from yeah. it. Most of our family, at least one person in our family has had cancer. We see what we go through. And we already choose to keep smoking. I've been smoking since I was 12. We're gonna die anyways. <laughs> Wanna have fun. We're all gonna die sometimes. It's just we've died different ways. We're all gonna die sometime. First pack of cigarettes I ever bought. Camel Straits. My first brand was Marlboro Lights. I went from Marlboro's to Parliament, to Newport. I've been through all the cigarettes. I've always smoked Marlboro Reds. Marlboro. Marlboro Red. Newport. My mom smoked Newports. Smokes Newports. I don't think she ever quit smoking. Winston. And then I went to Marlboro Lights, and then I went to Marlboro Medium. October 1994. At the American Pride Tobacco Company, a secret strategy session is in. My mom used to smoke in the car all the time, too. Every day on the way she would drive me to school. Smoking. Smoking. Progress. On the way back, smoking. She's smoking every time she's in the car, smoking all the time. In the room are J.P. Cameron, President, and Janine Wiley, Vice President of New Products. Their agenda, to develop a new cigarette for the youth market. The American Pride Tobacco Company needs a new cigarette. And we need one fast if we're going to compete with Philip Morris or R.J. Reynolds. This industry's got 5,000 customers every day quitting or dying off. Don't say the D word, J.P. Never say the D word. You've got 5,000 people every day who stop using the product. Right. And You're statistics right. show. I hate statistics. I know, I know. They're so darn depressing, aren't they? Especially in this business. But what they show is, if you haven't started smoking by 19, you're probably not gonna smoke. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, the way I see it, we've gotta get 5,000 kids hooked every day just to keep our profits up. Let me put it another way. Okay, give me a spin. First off, don't say kids, say pre-smokers. And don't say hooked, say introduced to the pleasures of smoking. You're right, you're right. Okay, we are not getting kids hooked. We are introducing pre-smokers to the pleasures of smoking. And I've got the perfect new brand those little jerks are gonna wanna buy. What do you got? I've got Frank Mule. Frank Mule? You bet. And what does Frank Mule smoke? Mule cigarettes. It's cool, it's gross, it's totally dumbed out. Just like our target customers. It's brilliant. Mule Get it, cigarettes. Joe Camel. You're gonna love our slogan. What is it? It's... <laughs> grab one. Kids all over the country are gonna go crazy. I can see Frank Mule t-shirts. Frank Mule calendars. Grab one. And great big Frank Mule billboards right outside of... I remembered Joe Camel. It's weird to think about, because, you know, I was young at the time, but like... There were cigarette advertisements everywhere, and that fucking camel. <laughs> School. And look at this. Frank at the beach, checking out all the girls. Frank shooting pool. This is gonna be big. Big. It's humongous. It's the first cigarette made just for morons. This is a special report. It is illegal to sell cigarettes to anyone under 18. 
We asked underage children in several states to try to buy cigarettes, and we followed them with our undercover cameras. First time I bought them, I was kind of scared because I was just scared that I could. How undercover could this camera possibly be? Get caught or something, but after the first time. Does one of the kids have a suspiciously large hat that they're hiding a camera in? <laughs> It's just all normal kids, and then one kid with like a, a, a Abraham Lincoln hat with a big camera lens sticking out. And I was just like, oh, okay, this is easy, I can do this. The lines I use to um, try and get cigarettes, if they ask, I'll just be like, well, I'm here with some friends, and I left my ID at home because they're driving me. Another one I'll use, I'll just say like, yeah, I'm 22. And sometimes there's a store right down the street. I'll just go in there. He won't even ask. And how old are you? I'm 14. Oh. Buying cigarettes today is the easiest. It's like walking in and buying a, a piece of Kit Kat or something. I was never carded. I just walked in and asked, and I just got them. I just go, <coughs> yeah, let me get some Salem lights. I don't think they really care as long as you have the money. Studies show that cigarettes are sold to three out of four underage kids who try to buy them. Fucking seriously? That's crazy. They must not have enforced that at all at the time. They do now, but like, they must have not been like, having nearly as many people go in and like, test. Cause like, regulators go in and, and check now. Like, they'll send people to stores like 7-Elevens and places that sell cigarettes basically and test them and say you didn't check for my ID. They take it seriously. CloudWizard42 says the girl in the picture has a lunch, now has a lunchbox. Knock, knock. Who's there? Emphysema. Emphysema who? Emphysema smoking. Tell her to save a pack for me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think I've seen enough of why you shouldn't smoke. Hmm. Again, with these containers, they create a nothing at all. And then in a landfill. Hmm. Telephone doctor, bad telephone manners will shock button tool. It's only in the left ear. Remember the telephone doctor. Remember the telephone. I won't do that. I hate mono stuff. Oh my god, it's the Fonz! Holy shit! Confidence is what we have to do, so we'll have strong kids, safe kids, strong parents too. Turn together, learn together, it's up to Yeah, Henry Winkler's still alive. Strong kids, safe kids! Hey, would you listen to that beautiful chorus of voices? Thanks, kid. And now I'd like you to meet a very good friend of mine. We're almost flesh and blood, you know? Mr. Henry Winkler. Hey, take a bow, Henry. Hi, I'm very glad to see you. <laughs> and I'm very glad to see you. And I'm very glad to see you. And parents, I'm very happy to see you. We're all here for the same reason. We have children, and we love them. And I'm here to remind him that he was once a kid, too, like you and me, you know? This is about taking care of kids and kids taking care of themselves. We've got to share the responsibility in learning safety skills. I mean, what could be better than taking charge? So let's take charge. Hey, you're cool, huh? So here we are, parents and children together. We're going to learn about each other. We're going to learn about ourselves. Working at AOL, your mother got a tech support call from him. How did she know? Like, his name was just Henry Winkler on the land, and she was like, are you the Henry Winkler? And he was like, yeah, I'm the Fonz. ...and what to do to prevent sexual abuse and abduction. Big words, heavy topics, but I want you kids to know this is not a big and heavy program. Matter of fact, it only weighs about a pound and a half. <laughs> 
No, we got a lot of surprises for you along the way, so sit there, enjoy yourself. Or I'm gonna run over your knees with my bike. <laughs> there are a couple of friends I'd like you to meet. Key McFarlane. Hey, did I hear somebody say Key McFarlane? Terrific lady, knows what she's talking about. Close personal friend. The first job I ever had in life was working in a children's home for emotionally disturbed kids. I was in charge of six or seven little girls who I learned had all been sexually abused when they were very young. I tried to explain that to the professionals in the agency and nobody would listen to me. They told me it wasn't true and not to believe the children. And I realized they were trying to hush me up the same way they were trying to hush up the kids. And it seems like I've spent the rest of my career trying to convince grown-ups to listen to children. And Saul Gordon, whose life's work it is to keep families family. And this is a program for families. And... No! 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 Yeah, and about 57,000 kids that were trained by the staff of the Children's Self-Help Project up in San Francisco. Don't forget Chris Wallace. And me, Marriott Hartley. Hi. Now let's try that again. A one and a two. Why is Papa Smurf here? <laughs> me too, John Ritter. Hey, hello. Oh. <laughs> oh, that made me sad. Uh, what was that? Hey. A few other friends that are going to help us out. Now listen, this is very important. You stop this program whenever you want. See, it's not made to look at like an ordinary TV show. Yeah, hey, kids, you got that? I mean, you look over, you see your dad looking confused or embarrassed. Tell him to turn off the program, look him straight in the eyeball, and say, hey, you want to learn something? Because <laughs> you kids got the answer, right? You're cool. I want you to watch it. I want you to watch it over and over again. Watch it with your friends, watch it with your family, and talk about it so that our message becomes yours. Yeah. Now, listen, you know about on, you know about off. Now we're going to get heavily into repeat. <laughs> repeat. I like that. Repeat. All right. Repeat. The kids never talk. Nobody talks to me. I feel left out. This is a really crucial time for kids. It's a time when they need to be listened to, to be believed in. This is really important for their self-esteem and also important so that they'll grow up to be healthy adults. It's stupid. There's lots of things you don't tell grown-ups when you're a kid. My parents don't listen to me. We think they wouldn't understand. It isn't fair. It's just not fair. But some things we need to tell them because they're bigger than us and they can help. <gasps> what was that? This is the VHS equivalent of jingling your keys in front of a baby. Yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> oh. You may be watching this program because of any number of sensational cases of child abuse or abduction that you've been hearing about. Of course, the main worry is... Uh... Who is this for? <laughs> okay, here's the problem. Either... You make the adult video for parents explaining like, hey, here, here are things that are dangerous for your kid and why you should listen to your kid. Because if you don't and you take what they're saying for granted and like uh, thinking they're not telling the truth, then your kid could end up being abused or whatever. You know, horrible things could happen to them if you don't listen to your kids. And you do that in an adult way with these talking heads of professionals, psychiatrists and, and childcare experts and stuff. Or... <laughs> You do the video for little kids that's, like, full of cartoon characters and, like, oh, stranger danger. You should tell your parents when weird things are happening and things are making you uncomfortable, you know? But this is, like, both, and they edited them into each other, so it's, like, not good for adults or children? It's really weird. Will it happen to your child? It's the last thing we want to hear. Or the one thing... We don't want to believe, so we can't hear it, that somebody has harmed or betrayed my child in a sexual way. Sometimes without meaning to do so, we, we blame the child. Here's the way it happens sometimes. 
Why didn't you tell me? I did, I did. I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. And sometimes in our anxiety, we, we blame the child. We say, why, why did, did you, you let, let him, him do it? it? You told me I always had to obey grown -ups. Oh, my God. The other part is that we really have to listen more carefully to what our children are saying to us. <laughs> oh, this is triggering some shit in me. <laughs> That's right, baby Smurf. Always tell someone you trust. Don't keep it to yourself. If we figure out how we feel about some very important questions, it'll be a lot easier talking to our children about anything. You're on your way to becoming an askable parent. Oh, yeah, I can dig that, and I'm on my way. Okay, I can't do this one. This is... Mm -mm. Uh... Jesus. I probably would have worn that hat as a kid. Rock, paper, scissors. You're first. Are okay, Red Letter Media covered this video. I remember it. You can't play four player rock, paper, scissors. That's not how this works. How did they determine a winner? Alright, I'm first. Oh man, this has to act like my mother. <laughs> Use your table manners, there is not polite to reach and grab. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's my turn. Oh no, this is crazy. I'm not doing this. Go, girl, girl go, go, girl. Okay, I need some lipstick and a blindfold. Here's the lipstick. And here's the blindfold. Okay, you have to put lipstick on me with the blindfold on. <laughs> For the Reagan Clinton era, era, there sure were a lot of leftist audio problems in media. Funny. <laughs> it's my turn. What does it say? I have to. You're getting constant auto mod messages. I have no idea. That's not showing up on my thing. Weird. Hmm. I have no idea why. I need the wildest dream I've ever had. Hmm. Well, you see, I've been working on a report for school. It's about manners. Sounds boring, huh? But it's re what class are you taking? Really not. It's cool. Well, I guess I've been working so hard that I actually dreamt about it last night. Here, how my dream began. At first, I was in a fast food restaurant. As I walked to the table with my food, I saw some friends from school. Michael called me over. He's really cute. He almost covered me in ketchup. That was so rude. Can you imagine if it would be your job to clean up after all those kids? They were just having fun. Yeah, but when I did my report, I learned that etiquette is all about having respect for others, no matter where you are, even in a fast food restaurant. Then, I guess I was a manners teacher or something. You all were there. Sauce, sauce. Listen, please. The first thing to remember at a fast food restaurant is always clean up after yourself when you...
Age Baird says, oh god, I used to have that haircut. The 90s levels in this video are reaching dangerous levels. We're finished eating. You must show respect for others at all times. And absolutely no running, screaming, or wild behavior. Now remember, clean up your spills. Be polite. Because being rude just isn't civilized. Then, I was in ancient Egypt watching Cleopatra. You see, an ancient Egyptian manuscript of the Tahoe Tet, written in 2500 BC, that's about 4500 years ago, contains the first writings on manners. Refreshments, please. I'm uncomfortable with Cleopatra having a young boy servant. Remind me, boy, of the proper way to eat grapes. The proper way to eat grapes is with your fingers. Oh, queen. Would you like that pill? Not this time. See? Cleopatra paid close attention to her manners. <laughs> Well, she was a queen, after all. <laughs> <laughs> then, my dream took me to ancient Israel, where a rabbi named Derek Eris Rava wrote, Drink should be sipped slowly, never gulped, and a morsel of bread lifted to the mouth should be no larger than an olive. Come in. Come in already. Your evening meal, Uncle. Thank you. Close the flap. It's a desert out there. You'll track sand all over the tent. Anything else? No, sit down, sit down. Watch and learn. <laughs> what the fuck? I'll never gain any weight like this. <laughs> and Olive, get real. <laughs> How long did you sleep anyway? Like days? <laughs> Listen, there's more. Then I was in Italy in 1290 A.D. An Italian monk named Bon Vicini da Liva wrote 50 courtesies at the table. He was really tired of seeing people eat with terrible table manners. There'll be no feet on the table in my monastery. We practice the 50 courtesies of the table. People actually used to pick their nose and teeth at the table, too. Not to mention all the burping and the snorping that went on. Okay, I want the musical number. There's a lot more. Take no salt nor cut any bread if the knife be greasy. Ever again. That's for sure. <laughs> this song slaps. It's 8 o'clock and we're ready to rock. Get your elbows off the table. Put your napkin in your lap. Stop playing with your food and join us in our rap. Check it out. This is how the table's set. Knives on the right, forks on the left. Spoons chilling next to the knife, plates in the middle, and the glasses to the right. Utensils are used from outside in. Remember this, and you'll know where to begin. Put your napkin in your lap, it's the first thing you do. Just leave it right there till the dinner's through. When don't be a drip, wipe your lips. And mind, mind your, your manners, manners man. man. 
for the soup. You use it, it's big and round. To the right of the plate is where it's found. Don't slurp your soup, don't reach and grab. When you butter your bread, just take a, a little, little dab. dab. Don't use your knife that's sharp on the end. Save that for your meat, my friend. And don't be a drip. Wipe, Wipe your lips and, and mind your manners, man. man. When the salad comes around, don't look like a dork. Reach to the left and grab the small fork. So eat your greens and veggies too, because healthy food is the best for you. Don't make a mess with your food. If you do, you'll look pretty rude. Only take what you need and finish what you take. To waste good food is a big mistake. Don't be afraid to try something new. A new experience is good for you. And don't be a drip. Wipe your lips and mind your manners, man. <laughs> Is this Hamilton? Yes. Now it's time for the main course. So grab the sharp knife and the large fork. Hold your utensils just so. If you do, you'll be good to go. It's so easy to do it right. Remember, just take a small bite. If your meat is giving you strife, just cut it, cut it, cut it with a knife. When the meal is over, you'll want something sweet dessert. It's just a thing to eat. You need a utensil you can't lose. The last ones left are what you'll use. And don't be a drip. Wipe your lips and mind your manners, man. So don't lick your lips and fingers too, but ask to be excused when you are through. Don't forget the words please and thank you. We said enough and now we're through. So you're hip to this and hip to that. No, it's a wrap. Beautiful. Now, check this out. Do I have to? Is Remember, this... put your neck in it. Oh, it's just gonna go over it again. No. <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, no! Do we need to learn how to be a clown? Did I see Redler Media do a review of a Carmen music videotape? I did. That was a good episode of Best of the Worst. Oh, this is gonna be bad. Oh God! Oh no! <laughs> no! No! Oh God! What the fuck? Why in the world did any human ever like this? Why is this a thing? Like the performance aspect is fine, but the makeup, the makeup is no. I don't think Red Letter Media covered this one. They covered a different clown training video because there's apparently multiple. Is this not even clown training? Is this just 30 minutes of a clown routine?
No, okay, it does explain it. Cool, cool, cool. This is just showing a little bit of it. Like, this stuff's cool. I like juggling and different, like, performance, like, things like that. But the makeup! Take off the makeup! It's horrifying! Did this clown invent devil sticks? He got them directly from Satan. T-Bone! Audience, but first I... I'm T-Bone. I was practicing for the big clown show tomorrow here at the school. Say, maybe if you don't mind, I could practice with you as my audience. But first I have to find my book on the art of clowning. It's here a minute ago. Now a look into our future. Oh, God. A million times! Oh. Well, did I show you my rash? No! Oh, no, 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 Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Satellite Love. My name's Joel Robinson. About three weeks ago, I set up this hollow clown sequencer to cheer up the bots, but now I can't get it to turn off, and it's getting hard to sleep at night, and I'm tasting metal. Hey, little girl. Would you like a salted nut roll? Ah, Joel! <laughs> Do I remember devil? Oh, God. Yeah, I remember those. I mean, they're still, a, like, people still use them for shit, like, for dumb performance things. I say dumb. That's mean. But yeah, people do that. Now, where did I put it? You wouldn't happen to know where my book is, would you? Where? Oh, God. I don't see it over there. It's where? No, I don't see it over there either. Now, where could it possibly be? Where? Up there? Oh no, you're not gonna fool me again. Ouch! <laughs> I guess you were right after all. And now, on with the show. Did you know that clowning has been part of our history for a long, long time? Some of the first clowns, known as court jesters, entertained for kings and queens. They brought lots of smiles to their audiences, just like the clowns of today. Let's take a look at some of the modern types of clowns that you may be interested in becoming. There are three basic types. The white face, and the auguste, and the character. Just like playing a musical instrument or learning a new sport, being a clown is fun, but also involves hard work and practice. I feel like this video has too much clown bulge. Some people are really unhappy with what they do for a living. Or not enough, I guess, if you have a clown fetish. <laughs> not me. I love being Either way, it's the wrong amount of clown bulge. <laughs> clown. Yeah, beats working for a living. <coughs> Hi, kid. What did I tell you about happy people? Here comes one now. I've got an idea. Let's cheer this guy up. It'll be hard work. But fun! Excuse me, sir. I'm T-Bone. Yo, what are you, the new principal or some kind of dog food? No, my line of work is clowning. <laughs> Clowning's not work. Uh, it's a red nose, baggy pants, and 50 midgets jumping out of a car. This isn't going to be easy. I do believe you've lost your sense of humor, Mr. Uh... Drab. Artie Drab. I've not lost my sense of humor. I got... Oh, God, why is it not loading? One second. They don't want us to see the clown video! Got work to do. I don't have time to play. Boo! Buffer! <laughs> I want to see the clown! <sighs> Clowning's not work. Uh, it's a red nose. There we go. I think it's maybe working now. Baggy pants and 50 midgets jumping out of a car. This isn't going to be easy. I do believe you've lost your sense of humor, Mr. Uh... Drab. Arty drab. I've not lost my sense of humor. I got work to do. I don't have time to play. Would you say your name was? T 
T-Bone. Ha! That's not a clown's name. They got names like, uh... Bob Why does this video not want to play? Is it just that section? That's weird. Ho, 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 ho. You are not a chicken. What do I look like? Well, you look like a clown. That's right. I always wondered what it'd be like to be a clown. Do I make the joke I want to make? Well, there's no time like the present. Wow, 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 wow. How'd you do that? Pretty well, thank you. Have a seat. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Why aren't you sitting down? I don't have a chair. <laughs> Take mine. Oh. <clears throat> What's the problem? Oh, I know. Oh, boy. Setting up the clown hypno vids. Okay, I wasn't the only one who had the thought. <laughs> Hi, Cassie. That was really neat. Oh, this is really fun. The joke I was going to make was this has the same tone of effectively... <laughs> Never mind. You know what? Never mind. I don't know how many s straight people are in my audience, and I don't need to explain this shit. <laughs> Aren't you gonna sit down? No, I understand. Thank you. Wow, look at all this stuff. Uh, what do I put on first? First, you have to decide what kind of clown you want to be. You mean there's different kinds of clowns? Oh, yes. Three types. The first type of clown is the white face. The white face is sophisticated and graceful and has an elegant costume. The next type is the uh, yeah. August, uh, uh, Augusti. No, silly, Auguste. The Auguste clown is the silliest of the three. They have very bright colors and silly outfits. And exam They're gonna force clown this guy. <laughs> mouths and faces and use pink and red as their colors and the third type is the that's right the character they dress like different people oh like a policeman or a fireman or a cowboy or a hobo Artie I do think you're getting the hang of this what type of clown do you want to be um an august yeah that's a type of clown for me I like the white face makeup is it possible to combine the two? That's the style of many modern day clowns. Oh, goody, goody. Oh. What's next? Oh, I like this nose. He's a clown egg. <laughs> and, and this one? <laughs> that one's funny. How about a wig? Uh, do I need one? And what about those big feet? Slow down, slow down. Remember, one step at a time. Oh. First, your face. Lesson number one, make sure your hair is out of your face and your eyes. And that can be done with a cap and pins. Next, make sure you get something for around your neck, because you don't want your neck to be all makeup-y. I like this. Oh. Artie, are you sure you haven't been a clown before? <laughs> oh no. Like this. And this. He's gonna get on hormones to get those big clown feet. <laughs> Why are you judging me? What? 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 <laughs> this man is a is a trans icon. His pronouns are honk honk. Next, take a gaba goopa of white clown makeup with these two fingers like this and rub it in your palm like this. A gaba what a? A gaba goopa. Hey, it's turning shiny and getting warm. <laughs> That's how you know it's ready to be put on your face. Rub your hands together like this and then put it on your face like this. Oh boy. 
Hey, I'm really getting the hang of this. Ooh, not for the nose. Slow down, Artie. You should look into the mirror. Huh? My face is all streaked. How do I get to look like you? By tapping your face with these two fingers. Gee, my face is getting smooth. That looks Could he good. not figure out blending? Sure. <laughs> oh, now no. Now you have to decide where you want your mouth to be. <laughs> it's right here, silly. No, Artie, your clown mouth. Where do you want your clown mouth to be? And what kind do you want to have? You mean there are different kinds of clown mouths? Yes, there are. There are mouths that make you happy. There are mouths that Unrealistic make clown you station sad. goals. There are small mouths and mile-wide mouths. Ooh, uh, I like the one on the top left. How do I put it on? First, we need to take off the makeup where you want your mouth to be. Well, why didn't you tell me that before I put it on? Let's use cotton gauze and remove the makeup where you want your colors to be. We can use Kleenex and also cotton swabs, like that. We can also do the same thing with eyebrows and anywhere else you want your color to be. Like H. Baird says, hey now, baby trans, I mean, baby clowns don't have the best makeup skills. I have been out for years, and I'm still bad at makeup. <laughs> Stars, tears, <laughs> and flowers. Hey, I look like a pumpkin. Am I ready to put colors on now? First, you need to powder your makeup. The powder sets the makeup. Oh, here's the powder. Like this? Uh, not, <laughs> not exactly. Get a setting spray. Try this. This is much better. Now, take a deep breath <gasps> and hold it. We don't want to breathe in the powder, do we? It's important to be safe. Isn't that right, Artie? Artie? Artie, it's okay to take a breath once the powder's on. <gasps> now you tell me. <sighs> now let's brush off the excess powder. What? Will you make up your mind? First on, then off. <sighs> Not exactly. Try this. Oh. This one. Hey, how do you get these things to stay on? <laughs> With fish line, elastic string, and spirit gum, which works like glue. There are several kinds of wigs that can be found in magic, clown, and wig shops. Or you could make your own from things at home. Like this? Artie, time to put these things away. Whoa! Boy, I wish you'd warn me before you do that. Time for costumes, costumes, costumes. Walk this way. Look at all these costumes. Oh, there's a one-piece costume. Oh, boy, does that look neat. Oh, look at the red pocket and the little hat. <laughs> I like that. Oh, oh, is that one of those hobo costumes? Oh, boy, I'd look real spiffy in that one. Is that an alligator in the next... Hold on. Why did I see an alligator on the ground in the next shot? I assume it's a prop. That's a prop. Your other right hand. Now, let me get mine, too. Good. You have one, and I have one. Okay. Let me put it in my right hand. That's great. Next, throw back and forth like this. A little higher. Make sure you hit those imaginary points. That's good. Okay. Next. Clowning sure is fun, but it takes a lot of hard work and practice, just like you said. And from now on, I'm going to practice a new skill every day, starting now. Good for you. Goodbye, t -bone. I'm very happy for this clown. <laughs> Goodbye, my new friend, Artie. My name's not Artie. It's... <laughs> Don't dead name the clown. The Magnificent. Matic. <laughs> Thank you. 
Marte, the balancing clown. <laughs> Careful! I think my balancing needs some more practice. Well, it certainly has been a busy day today. I want to thank you for helping me Hello, practice. Father. Say, I got an idea. Maybe you could get your parents and friends to help you practice. Just remind them to be careful when they put makeup around their eyes. And don't forget to get them to help you clean up afterwards. Remember, you don't have to have a real fancy clown to have fun. Just a simple dot on your nose, and you're on your way. I fully went into this video <laughs> expecting to make fun of this fucking guy and call him weird. I am so happy for him and the other clown. <laughs> After all, the secret to clowning is that clowning comes from the heart, just like yours. <laughs> That is a that is a positive positive clown. <laughs> Fucking right on. Right on. That was that was wholesome shit. I am on board for it. Hi kids, welcome to Monster Chiller Horror Theater. Oh boy, we have a scary movie for you. It's all about this little girl who's left alone in her house, all by herself. Oh, 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 oh. What? What's so scary about that? Well, there's a thunder and lightning and <laughs> and a, a full moon. Oh. Oh boy! <laughs> it's gonna be so scary. You, 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 you're gonna so watch the movie. Oh, I can't believe it. They treat me like I'm a little kid. Like I've never been home alone before. I've been home alone lots of times. <laughs> A little cinnamon toast. Why do you have none of the lights on in your house? You never said the, the power isn't Nothing out. Like a nice piece of cinnamon toast to calm your nerves. Cinnamon toast is a good choice. That's a nice piece of cinnamon toast. Beard says, I got left home all the time when I was a kid. When else was I gonna try on my sister's clothes? 
I didn't have any siblings, so. There, what? <laughs> That's embarrassing, I'm not gonna say. Wait a oh no, not gin. My parents always drink this to calm their nerves. Uh, I mean, who's gonna know? Party time. <laughs> Fuck yeah! <laughs> drink it! scratching against the window. It's just a branch scratching against the window. It's just a tree branch. It is just scratching against the window. <laughs> She was making toast. <laughs> How fucking long did you set the toaster for? Why does your toaster have a start a fire setting? <laughs> oh my god, unplug the toaster. Yeah, use the fork. Do it, do it, do it. I just know we'll see who has the last last. <laughs> <laughs> And that's how this kid died. <laughs> Bad idea, Kathy. Bad idea. <laughs> oh, Sam. You did this with a French bread pizza? Did you put a French bread pizza in the toaster? The cheese is gonna drip everywhere and start a fire. I'll, I'll, I'll do something that, that that you won't like very much. I'll do I'll, I'll do something really. Oh! Wait, wait a minute. Oh, oh that's me. Look at that, it's me. Oh boy, I can't believe how stupid I was. <coughs> that's the phone. Ah! <laughs> I just noticed, is her shirt accidentally trans flag colors? <laughs> it kind of looks like it. 
When you see them in uh, better light, for sure. All right. That's better than aerobics. Oh, you've been taking aerobics classes, huh? <laughs> well, we go to the same health club. Ah, I see. So, kid, what's your name? Kathy. You think this is Gilbert Godfrey free in his most obnoxious role as a fire alarm? Have we watched this? I remember Be Cool About Fire Safety. I actually watched this as a kid. Be cool about fire safety. only in one ear. Oh my god, the other, the right ear is a fucking garbled nightmare, too. A real superhero. Where's Gilbert Godfrey? I just want to see Gilbert Godfrey do his thing. <laughs> the more smoke I see, the more noise I make. And I see more smoke coming from that toaster. <gasps> Thanks for warning us, Seymour. That's my job. <coughs> I hate. That's creepy. <laughs> hmm. Something strange is going on. There are forces out there trying to control your mind. They're sending out messages all day and all night. And most of the time, you don't even know what they're doing. And these messages are meant for you. These forces have spent millions of dollars studying your thoughts, your beliefs, and your behaviors in the hopes to go out and buy Oh, stuff. it's about ads. It was called ad-libbing it. So I thought it was some terrible video about improv. And let me tell you, as someone who's done improv, there's nothing worse than improv. <laughs> You know what the key to good improv is? Editing. <laughs> improv is a tool. Uh, going to a live improv show does not sound fun to me because the best part about improv is you throw things out. Sometimes it's funny. You keep that. You throw out 90% of everything else. Never say no. It's true. But also... Like, <laughs> have you ever been in an improv situation and someone takes the whole bit in a direction you really don't want it to go, but you have to say yes anyway? <laughs> Not a fun time. <coughs> is that why this show is so good? I just pre-edit everything in my head. <laughs> hmm. I never said this show was good, okay? You keep showing up. This is your fault. Oh. <laughs> How to become a teenage ninja?
my god, it's a white guy doing martial arts! Wait, why did they that make them calmer? That should freak them out. A man is brandishing swords in front of them. Welcome. I am Dao, master of all ninja warriors. Amir, Joshua, Santino, and Jennifer. You are not here by chance. You have each been chosen, as I have chosen others before you. Each of you sword on? shall be taught the ancient art of the ninja warrior. But who are you? Where do you come from? How do you know our names? I am from the earth, the sun, and the moon. Why is the spirit of a Japanese martial art a white guy? I can take many forms. A bird in flight, a fish, any animal that you know. And this white guy. <laughs> I have chosen to take this form of a young man in order to teach you the special physical and mental powers of the ninja warrior. So you will never have to run away again. Sounds great to me. Let's get started. Wow. Hey, this is great. Totally cool. Great. Man. Hey, can I keep it? This is too weird. Am I dreaming? You're very much awake. And you, young man, will leave here with much more than a uniform if you earn your way. You will leave with a. <laughs> no. As it shall be for you all. Why, who's the second guy? Is this also you? Is this a Trinity situation? But it's all nin it's ninjas? It's all ninjas? This is my assistant. Oh. He was much like you when he first came to me. Now, he is a full ninja warrior. Is this the Foot Clan? Are you are you bringing us into the Foot Clan? Because I don't have time like to do a whole fighting turtles thing. Like, if this is a once-a-week deal, that's fine, but I cannot spend time fighting Splinter. Along with me, we shall guide you through the four levels of training. First, you must learn to live by and follow the rules of life. Honor and obey these three fundamental rules, and you will leave here a better person. Courage should be in your heart. Oh, is that just a power your sword has? It can make floating words? Is that karate? How does that work? Self-control in your mind. And strength in your body. Can it make any word or just those words? Attention! Good. Before we teach you level one, you must first learn to breathe properly. Take a deep breath in through your nose. And exhale slowly through your mouth. Good. Now together, five deep breaths in. Vinny Sathoff, thanks for 16 months, says 16 months of awesome Hannah Reloaded content. Come for the chud, stay for the chat. Well, I'm glad you've been here for 16 months. Hope you're here for 16 more. Out. In. Out. Breathe deeply. In. Out. And in. Out. Oh my god, we can learn to microwave stuff, guys. You have to stir and poke and taste and adjust and improvise and... I get th 
thousands of letters from cooking classes. And the most common mis- Did you close the door? Conception about- I know it's not a real house, but that's weird that you came in and didn't close the door. Microwave cooking is that somehow the machine does the cooking. This just isn't so. You do the cooking. You have to stir and poke and taste and adjust and improvise and do all the other things that you do in conventional cooking. So you see, you are the cook and the microwave oven is just a machine that heats the ingredients. But it does so with two important benefits. First, the mess of cooking is much less, and the final result is realized much sooner than when using conventional... He has not seen the inside of my microwave. ...methods. What you to learn in the next hour is to overcome any fears that you may have about microwave cooking, whether based on the technology of it or learning how to use it. After all, it's just a tool, like all the other tools in your kitchen, and you are the cook. You see all these beautiful dishes on this table? Well, I'm going to show you what you have to learn to prepare dishes like this yourself. Don't microwave a turkey. Now, you might think that you can't, but oh, yes, you can. And it's so simple, and here's what I'm going to show you. I'll explain first about cooking in general, and then microwave energy in particular. Then I'm going to show you some experiments that you can try yourself to not only get the feel of how the oven works, but why it works that way. And then there are my 11 important tips that every cook needs to know. Know how a microwave works. I just want to see oven. you try and cook a turkey. I'm not even saying it's impossible. Like, maybe maybe with a big-ass microwave, you could make a turkey not kill you if you ate it, but it would taste disgusting. <laughs> it would be the rubberiest fucking thing ever. Rearrange the metal or use a different dish. The wing. Oh, he's straight up gonna do the bird, okay. And for large turkeys, you'll sometimes see that the breast portion right up here will tend to drop. There's tin foil on it. That can't go in the microwave. Dry out, and you have something that we call turkey jerky. Stew, or something in a microwave dish, and covered it with plastic wrap. Now you can see these woody carrots that have less water than some other vegetables sugars on the surface of the meat. For example, on some of my recent television shows, I prepared a number of dishes that came out really great. See how beautifully the browning process works? Minutes. Now that's the color of a chicken cooked conventionally. A lot of times you forget that that's the color without basting. This is just plain old chicken. Now here is a chicken, and here's another one that I did in the microwave oven. This one, I cooked very, very quickly. 20 minutes, it's completely cooked. Oh my god, it must be the rubberiest fucking thing in the universe. Rubbery and dry. Why would you microwave a chicken? At high power in the microwave. And here's one that I did for 45 minutes at 30% power. So you can see the difference. There's relatively no difference whatsoever. The reason that this one got a little browner than this one is that I did it slower and approximating the time of the chicken cooking the conventional oven so it had a chance to develop that caramelization which is what lends the color to any food that's in a microwave or a conventional oven. Now of course you can enhance your cooking by using any number of browning agents. Uh, there's some on the market, look around, you can find they give it a, a, I think it's a better color and again the point is make your food look as good as you can if you use, you base them, that's not unnatural, that's cooking and you pay particular attention to your cooking so it comes out the best that it will. This is soy sauce. You can use soy sauce for a browning agent. And even if you marinate in red power, so you can... Disgusting. Hey, yo, Professor, and chill out, man. Joseph, Another well, expert handle this. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, your mom and dad might have to worry. There we go. Little brother and sister, you don't have to. Okay, avoid uh, size. Don't get right next to the side. Hey, what? yo. I'm safety rider. Come along, kiddies, and I'm a safely guide you. Now, before you step inside, you check out the rules that I provide. Now you read all signs, you look and listen, it doesn't hurt to be alert, so you should pay attention. Elevators, escalators, moving walkways, you really gotta watch your step these days. Whole new thing now, elevators. Uh -huh. I love elevators. Now, if there's a fire, you stay calm and aware. Don't take the elevator, use the stairs. Gotta be 
It's like the penguin and McDonald clown had a son. Oh my god. Did we need a whole video to teach your kids not to be douchebags on elevators? I don't know. It just feels like it's... Did we need a whole eight minute video? Hey kid, watch your step on the escalator. It'll suck you under and you'll die horribly in a meat grinder. Hey, don't be a dick on the elevator. It's it's a it's a piece of equipment. You'll die. Don't fuck with the doors. Watch your step when you get on and off. Boom, done. Didn't need an eight minute video. Didn't need a creepy furry clown, okay? <laughs> okay. I think that's enough for today. Let's see who we're gonna raid. Uh. <sighs> All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow for Tinfoil Tuesday. Hans Wormhat just put out one of his worst videos ever. It's all about Martin Luther King Jr. And it's bad. So I'll see you guys then. <sighs> All right, adios. See you guys tomorrow.